Welcome back to Definitely Not Definitive. I'm Ken. And I'm Bethany. And we're just a tantalizing couple in love Ooh. that loves reacting to some Tekken. I like it. Yeah, you like that one? Yeah, nice. All right, so we're checking out uh, the insane lore of Tekken. Ooh. Yeah, and we're gonna do this in parts. Uh, so if you're following with us on Patreon, which we have a link down below in the description of this video for that. Yeah. Um, that's what we do, like our big cutscenes reactions and our big long videos. Uh, yep. We like to break them up into parts and weekly on Patreon, you can go check them out. But on YouTube, we do it as one big long video. The Insane Lore of Tekken, the first one, I think part is we do is Tekken and then like it's Tekken 2 and 3 and then 4 and 5 and then 6 and 7. Um, Tekken 8 is coming out and it's either later this year or early next year. Uh, so we need, to, we need to freshen up and, uh, and yeah. get our Tekken lore down. Definitely. If you want all of our Tekken reactions, check out the description of this video. We got a playlist there for you. Uh, we did a Tekken 7 uh, cutscenes reaction and then um, some, uh, you know, obviously the ultimates and whatnot and the supers, whatever for Tekken, we've done those as well. Yep. Growing up as a kid, I played a wide variety of video games, platformers, RPGs, <laughs> whatever the hell Seaman's supposed to be. But the type of game I played the most with my friends would have to be the fighting variety. Ah, Street, Street Fighter, Fighter, Mortal Kombat, yes. Dead or Alive, Soul Calibur. Just me and my buddies going one-on-one -on -one to beat the living piss out of each other. <laughs> and as much as I'd love to say that I'm a fighting game god, that couldn't be further from the truth. <laughs> I am terrible at these games. Like, I understand what I'm supposed to do. Blocking, zoning, super meters, write down rights for your shore yukins, you know. <laughs> but I just can't react to any of it fast enough. I hey, never use my assists effectively. I can't counter anything in DOA. I couldn't pull off a 10 string to save my life. Hmm. You'd more than likely kick my ass, but I'm still gonna have fun regardless. Good. Uh, button mashing or using muscle memory that I can't possibly articulate, yeah, it's mash. still satisfying to knock some virtual heads. There is an energy with this genre that is rarely matched. The speed, the music, the animations and VO. Hmm. Heaven or hell. Character goes a long way. If your game has lots of personality and feels satisfying to play, then you're gonna win me over. I mean, who didn't want to be yep. Ryu or Chung Li when they first played Street Fighter? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Love the ninjas of Mortal Kombat. Yeah. I remember booting up Soul Calibur 2 and being instantly drawn to Nightmare, hmm. the Azure Demon who wields the demonic blade Soul Edge. On a surface level, Nightmare is just an edgy dark knight. <laughs> These characters have lore behind them, and digging deeper helps you discover that this scary looking fighter is actually a tragic figure. Hmm. A man named Siegfried, one who sought the evil blade to gain the power that could avenge his father. When in reality, he was running away from the truth that he himself was the murderer. And this mm. delusion only fuels his descent to the dark side as he falls deeper and deeper into insanity ultimately becoming a shallow husk of the person he used to be. There's no turning back. Except there is, because when we get to Soul Calibur 3, Siegfried rejects the darkness inside him and regains his humanity, his story continuing on redemption. It's a fantastic soap opera that just expands with each new entry. But you had to find out this information yourself. See, nowadays every fighting game has a story mode of some sort, but back in the 90s and early 2000s, that wasn't the case. True. You picked your fighter, you took on a list of opponents, and if you were lucky, you got an ending with still images and text. <laughs> Hell, Mortal Kombat is the only game I remember that had biographies in the attract mode. Every other time, you had to consult the instruction booklet. And Virtua Fighter never had endings to their games, so those manuals are essential to know anything about the lore. Did you know that Pi is a Hollywood actress? Neither did I! Figuring out fighting game lore is like going Dude, to naked. Ikea. They give you the pieces, Practicing. but you have to assemble it yourself. Sweet and that thong. takes us to the topic Banana of today's hammock. video. <laughs> I'd like to talk about Tekken. Law. Tekken is one of Bandai Namco's best-selling franchises, each game always ending up with a Greatest Hits re-release. Everyone's heard of it, it's incredibly popular, but being a fighting game, its lore is still very hidden, very obscure. When Nintendo's Smash Bros. Ultimate was rolling out DLC, the second last fighter revealed was Kazuya Mishima, one of the major characters of Tekken. 
and it was interesting seeing all of this obliviousness from friends and strangers alike. They knew where he was from, but... Why does he turn into a purple demon man? <laughs> I mean, you'll watch all the big fighting game tournaments, Combo Breaker, Evo, and Tekken seems relatively normal at first. Just a bunch of martial artists fighting each other, right? And then in one match, someone will pick Jack, the gigantic metal robot with the pink mohawk. And then in another, someone will pick Panda, a panda Aww. bear that knows Mishima-style karate. And while they fight, the music that plays in the background might be a little... Strange. <laughs> Yodeling? Poor she. It's a franchise that looks really intense on the outside, Great. but behind the curtain is some really goofy shit. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that was was it Tekken Five that we checked out those endings for? <laughs> Lots of fighting games are silly and weird, but none of them <laughs> compare to Tekken. From the very first console release, they actually made special FMV endings for every character. Some were badass, some were wholesome, but a lot of them were just crazy. And it made you want to beat the game with every fighter just to see what would happen <laughs> next. That's what got me hooked onto the lore and why it's been too. living in my yeah. head all these years. And it always led to amusing conversations because people couldn't believe that Tekken was so cuckoo for Cocoa oh my Puffs. Gosh. <laughs> if you're trying to get into the series today, you'll start with Tekken 7. And while all of the past endings are unlockable, you still won't get any of the character backstories. Jumping in late means you'll have to do research if you want to learn about Elisa Boskanovich or why there's a boxing kangaroo. <laughs> Without access to the rest of the series, you don't have the full scope of what the hell's going on. And that's what this video is for. I've been a fan since Tekken 3. I own every game in the series, and these last few months I have watched every prologue, studied every ending, I have plunged deep into nice. the mythology so that I can cover it properly. Because wow. I want everyone to know just how crazy this series really is. So, without further ado, let's talk about the insane lore of Tekken. Okay. So one thing I should address right off the bat, the name! Tekken is Japanese for Iron Fist, the title of the tournament that is featured in every single game. And I think we're all saying it wrong. <laughs> I've been saying Tekken because that's what all the commercials said. There are games, and then there's Tekken 3. Oh yeah, Tekken 4 is here. I will defeat the Tekken fighters! <laughs> Tekken Tag Tournament. But in the game itself, they say it very differently. Enter the Tekken. Tekken Force. Tekken Fighters attacked her. Yeah, it's Tekken 7. Tekken Tag Tournament. Tekken, Tekken Blood Vengeance. Hmm. We all made fun of Michelle Rodriguez, but she knew what was up. We <laughs> literally spend all night playing like Tekken Fighter games oh, or yeah. Street Fighter. So, you know, I just thought it was worth mentioning. Anywho, on to Tekken 1. Nice. So this game Good came out in 1994, yep. where the saga begins with a father and his son who are training atop a giant mountain in Japan. This is the Mishima family, Heihachi and his five-year-old son, Kazuya. And unfortunately for the little yep. sport, his dad is a colossal asshole. Yep. For Heihachi has brought his son to this mountain with the intent of throwing him into a ravine. The logic being that if the boy was worthy of carrying his legacy, he would survive the fall. Obviously, being five years old, there wasn't much Kaz could do to stop this. <laughs> but throwing him off the cliff was the worst mistake Heihachi could have made. Yeah. Because not only does Kazuya yeah. survive, but he also vows revenge, their familial Good. bond forever broken. Yeah. We cut to 21 years later where Heihachi is doing pretty good for himself. Hmm. And this is where I start gushing about the guy. Not only is he my main when I'm playing the game, but the dude might be one of the most fascinating video game characters of all time. He is the CEO of the Mishima Zaibatsu, a gigantic <coughs> conglomerate that not only runs sporting events, but also funds military projects. A corporation that is so big and so rich that it has branches in Europe and America. Originally, it was on the up and up until Heihachi's father, Jinpachi Mishima, passed away. Look at that goddamn beard. Yep. 
One has to wonder if Jinpachi's death was legit, because as soon as Heihachi gains control, he starts using the company for organized crime. Hmm. He's basically the head of the Yakuza if it extended to the whole goddamn world. Oh, and no one dares cross Heihachi, because try as they might, the man is unkillable. Yep. <laughs> Oh, catches with the fucking mouth and pranks it! Oh no! He is the strongest fighter in the world. A man so badass that he can catch a tomahawk with his fucking teeth! The dude is <laughs> so intense it. that he once went into the wilderness and found a little baby grizzly cub. He brought the bear home and raised it to be his pet. But over the years, he taught it some new tricks, such as how to understand Japanese and how to fight. <laughs> I repeat, he raised a bear and taught it Mishima-style karate. <laughs> Heihachi awesome. has a grizzly bear for a sparring partner. This is a Damn. playable character, by the way. You can fight as the bear Kuma, whose character model was ugly as hell in the original game. <laughs> well, maybe a CG render is better. I Oh my god! <laughs> Oh, and it should be mentioned that it wasn't enough for Heihachi to throw his son off a cliff. He also adopted another child purely to be a rival to the boy. An orphan who was good at fighting off street punks, Lee Chowlon was officially made a Mishima, where he enjoyed the Zaibatsu's grand wealth. If you think that Lee loves his adopted father, uh, no. Huh. Like I said, Heihachi is a shitty father. <laughs> anyway, Heihachi is on top of the world. He's rich, he's powerful, but he feels so dissatisfied. Say what you will about his criminal ties, the man only wants a fair fight. To meet that challenger who can finally push him to his limits and best him in combat. And so he comes up with a brilliant idea. The King of Iron Fist Tournament. A call to every fighter in the world to see who can dethrone the Zaibatsu's head honcho and win the gigantic cash prize. And thus the stage for Tekken is set. A dozen weirdo fighters all coming together, including Kazuya, our would-be main character. Of course, you're not forced to play as Kazuya, but he is up front and center as the star. He gets the most screen time, he takes up all the space. Hell, the poster's tagline is all about him. But what I find interesting about this is that Kazuya is not a hero. At all. Typically in fighting games, the main character is a baby face. Ryu from <laughs> Street Fighter, Liu Kang from Mortal Kombat. Yeah. These guys don't have any dark intentions, they just want to do the right thing and make the world a better place. But not Kazuya. Like yeah, Heihachi's a criminal prick, but the goal isn't exactly noble. He wants to murder his father so that he can inherit the Zaibatsu and attain world domination. He doesn't want to restore honor to the company, he wants to be the new big bad. And this isn't a retcon. Even as early as the first instruction manuals, he is described as a cold-blooded man who wants his coup d'etat. Hmm. The main character is morally gray, and you're not supposed to root for him. I find that fascinating. It really yep. sets the tone for the Mishima storyline going forward. But let's talk about the other characters. Like Jack the Robot, a mechanical humanoid built by the Russian military, they enter Jack into the tournament because they caught wind of Kazuya's plans and want to stop him from winning. The rules for entering the tournament seem pretty lax because apparently it's okay for martial artists to fight giant robot men made of titanium. Although to be fair, Jack can't be that tough because its model was mass produced for jobbing. Yeah, it's not a unique machine. There are hundreds, and I mean hundreds of Jack robots that all operate exactly the same. And throughout the series, the fighters will dispatch these tin cans like they're nothing, because honestly, they are. Hmm. Although these mooks have been programmed to dab on top of their beaten <laughs> opponents, so I'll say that's kind of amazing. <laughs> Who designed the Jack Robots? Why, Russian scientist Dr. Boskanovich. <gasps> He's not a playable character, but he will become one Back in to the future. Three. This guy's basically the Dr. Light of Tekken. He's an incredibly talented scientist who will be responsible for a lot of the crazier fighters coming up. For now though, he simply built Jack and he made an artificial arm for another contestant, the Samurai Yoshimitsu. Which again, swords are allowed? <laughs> In the Iron Fist tournament? <laughs> eh, whatever. Yoshi here is a bit of a Robin Hood. He belongs to the Manji clan, a notorious bandit group that steals from the rich and gives to the poor. Nice. This clan has been around for hundreds of years, which leads to another fun factoid. Tekken is not the only series this character is in. 
because Yoshimitsu's Soul Calibur. ancestor, who has the exact same name and fighting style, is also present in Namco's Soul Calibur franchise. And, well, and but... Heihachi Mishima was actually a guest character for the PlayStation 2 version of Soul Calibur 2. Even Kuma is stronger than you. Hmm. But you don't care about that because everyone vastly prefers the GameCube version. It has Link, for God's sake! <laughs> <laughs> The most interesting thing about Yoshi here is that his sword, which is also called Yoshimitsu, is a demon blade that eats people's blood. Damn. If the weapon Ooh. is not sufficiently fed, it will gain the power to control its wielder's mind and unleash all kinds of evil. Or Luckily, this is never a problem wrong. because Yoshimitsu always punishes the wicked. But still, that's like sword kind of in, uh, insane. Fox Machina. Next up is King, a Mexican wrestler who always wears a jaguar mask. We only ever see his face once in the very first opening ever. He wrestles so that he can earn money to keep his orphanage afloat. Aww. His Mexican orphanage that's filled with Japanese children. <laughs> I love this cheesy live action ending. <laughs> the strangest thing about King is that he's not a mutant, he's not a science experiment, he's just a normal man. But rather than speak a normal language, he only speaks in Jaguar. <laughs> Tekken is like the only franchise I can think of where every character speaks their own native language. That's pretty cool. Usually mm -hmm. it's all English or all Japanese, but not this game. Paul Phoenix, the American, only speaks English. Heihachi only speaks Japanese. Lily speaks French, Leo speaks German, Claudio speaks Italian. It's mm. so strange to have a scene where three different characters are saying three different languages and everyone understands each other. all understand each other just <laughs> yep. fine. They can also understand Kuma, and all he does is roar. <laughs> Tekken is so goddamn weird. <laughs> it should also be mentioned that there is Armor King, another wrestler who wears a jaguar mask. His eye was crushed by King, which caused his wrestling career to suffer. Mm. He's entered the tournament for revenge. And then there is Anna and Nina Williams, the Williams sisters. Their parents taught the two how to fight to the point that they're both deadly assassins. But family or no, these two can't stand each other. <laughs> Anna always jealous of the attention her father gave Nina, and the latter always being cold and dismissive. Oof. Except when she's watching Tom and Jerry, because Nina's a big fan of Tom. <laughs> I didn't make that up. That's what the manual says. <laughs> <laughs> these two fight a lot. Like one time, Nina like deliberately stole and, uh, Anna's Lina. shoe, got mm -hmm. called out on it, and so she slaps the shit out of Anna, who cries at the abuse, and she laughs it off because, haha, I did have this shoe. <laughs> In Tekken 2, she just barges into the bathroom while Anna's showering and snaps a nudie pic without her consent. But it's okay because Anna got revenge when these three bodybuilder guys came up to flirt with them, and Anna took all three of them home. <laughs> no gangbang for you, Nina. <laughs> It should also be mentioned that Namco apparently thought Nina was so popular that she deserved her own spin-off game. Death by Degrees for the PS2. Hmm. It sucks, don't play it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not covering it because it's wildly inconsistent with Nina's backstory in the main games. But maybe I'll give it a deeper look some other time. I gotta speed this up. There's Michelle, the Native American whose family was ruined by the Zaibatsu. There's Ganryu, a Japanese sumo wrestler whose shameful yeah, behavior yeah. lost him respect. There's Martial Law, yes, that's his name, a chef working in San Francisco. <laughs> he looks and fights like Bruce Lee because every fighting game ever needed a Bruce Lee type. <laughs> With more anger into it. Marshall is best friends with another contestant named Paul Phoenix, and you don't want to sleep on this guy. He may be a brash, blowhard American, his hair would make a racer head blush, but this guy is legit. He once fought Kazuya Mishima before the tournament, and the battle ended in a draw. Damn. He didn't win, but he didn't lose either. He is on par with the protagonist. Remember that for later. And finally, I'll mention Wang Jinrei, a merchant and longtime friend of the Mishima family, in particular, Jinpachi. He's on good terms with Heihachi, but he doesn't really approve of all the criminal activity. Okay, that's the roster. Tekken 2 will go by a lot quicker because there's a lot of setup here. Going by character bios and story details from future games, I put together bullet points for what matches happened and who canonically won. This tournament's pretty straightforward. In the game itself, not every fighter is playable from the get-go. You have to unlock them through a specific character's campaign. 
and those unlock fights are all canon. Paul Phoenix hmm. defeated Kuma, Kazuya defeated Lee, hmm. Yoshimitsu defeated Ganryu, and even worse, he took all of his money. Money Damn. that he will not be getting back because it was given to people in much more need. Aww. King defeated Armor King, but this one had a happy ending mm -hmm. because Armor King realizes that he had truly been bested by a far superior wrestler. And rather than mm. hold a grudge forever, he decided it would be better to be in his corner. To be an ally instead of an enemy. Well, that's nice. <laughs> and then we come to the semifinals, the winner going on to face Heihachi. Kazuya versus Paul Phoenix. Their last fight ended in a draw, but this time, Kazuya pulls it out. He advances to the grand finals where Daddy Dearest awaits him. And for the first time ever, Heihachi knows the sting of defeat as his son bests him in the tournament. In what could only be called poetic justice, Kazuya decides to do the same thing that his father had done to mm -hmm. him. Oh, it was Katsuya, but Kazuya. That fucking smile. Yeah! Mm -hmm. <laughs> Creepy. Dude just murdered his father, and it's like, what a happy, wholesome moment. <laughs> Yay! That animation will never get old. But yeah, folks, with Heihachi supposedly dead, the Mishima Zaibatsu is now Kazuya's to control. Little does he know, however, it's gonna take more than that to kill his old man. All right, so what you think? I love that we're diving more into the lore of everything. Mm -hmm. And I really love, um, and I apologize if I pronounced any of this wrong, but Clement's J64's take on Tekken, because we've watched some lore stuff yeah. for Tekken. And it has always seemed insane to me. Yeah. So going into this as the insane lore and like, this is the wild ride that you are in for and buckle up and go with it. Um, he just did a really great job, I think, kind of breaking up some of the craziness that is this world. Yeah. Um, and I love the fact that, like, so we kind of knew about uh, some of this before since watching and, like, reading the comments of the different videos that we've done for, for, for Tekken, like, but really I've only known about, like, a little bit more about the Heihachi family and, like, their dynamics yeah. with, with each other. Um, didn't know that like the bear was somebody that Heihachi had picked up, Grizzly yeah. Bear, and trained. Um, had heard about Lee. Um, I'm interested in the Williams sisters dynamic. I want to learn more yeah. about that as we, as we continue to go on. I feel like that's going to be super interesting. Um, and then martial law and Paul, like he had said that you know Paul was uh, uh, Katia's. That like they had gone to a stalemate at first and then, you know, lost in the tournament, but that, you know, to keep an eye on him because he'll be important later on. Um, uh, yeah, I thought this was presented just in a very uh, easily digestible way for something that is like so insane. Um, yes. And yeah, so, so, so far so good. I'm really enjoying this. The sisters, very the much Williams sisters, yeah. remind me of like Betty and Veronica from the Archie comics in the, in the, aspect of they are oil and water. Mm. They don't mix. They are opposites in a lot of ways. And it seems like that holds very true here as well. Um, so I am curious to learn more about them as we go further into the Tekken world, because I find them very interesting. And I think that like, it's funny, uh, Tekken itself doesn't take itself seriously, which I, I, I think I find um, refreshing. Uh, in that sense, they're just like, you know what? We're just gonna, no idea is too crazy. Like, yeah, okay, so for the victory animation for uh, Nina, she's gonna bust in on her sister and take a picture of her nude and like, you know, use that to blackmail her or something like that. Like, like yep. just because, yeah, you know, that's just, that's what she wants and she wants to humiliate her sister and this seems like a great way. I also think it's really interesting the fact that like, Heihachi rescues a bear and yeah. trains a bear and seems to, at least in some capacity for whatever he is capable of, he values this bear in, in some regard. Um, hi. But, okay, Bucky wants to be a part of the video too. Hi. So he seems to value the bear, but when it comes to his son, he throws him off a mountain. Mm -hmm. um, and I just find that fascinating that you can be, you can have enough humanity to bring a bear into your inner circle in your family in, in some respect, 
but for your own child, you will actually try to murder them to make them stronger. And I think there's there's probably some truth in that. Like I think certainly some of us have met parents, either of us directly or, or friends along the way who just hold their own children to such a different standard yeah. from how they hold other people as to be almost unattainable. Um, and it can seem cruel. Now, I'm saying no. Throwing your child off a mountain is cruel. Let's not like yeah. misunderstand that. And it, that is effed up in every regard. But I'm just saying it is it is interesting to me, the, the character of Heihachi that, that he has this sort of duality within him to take take pity on a bear and bring a bear into the family, but to throw his kid off of a cliff. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, when you're being sweet, then you can go back to your mom. Now you can go back to your mom because you're being sweet. I also like the fact that like, so when we watched Tekken 7, we thought that uh, like Kazuya, or Katsuya, whatever the fucking name is, um, <laughs> he was like the one that we were kind of rooting for more than Heihachi. Like Heihachi, we just did not like at all. Uh, so I like the fact that like he was, like right from the start, he says that, you know, the the protagonists in this really aren't heroes. No. In, 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 any, in any way. Um, and so the heroes are kind of some of the side characters there, like uh, the uh, Yoshimitsu going and like being like the Robin Hood, taking someone's yeah. money and then spreading it around. It kind of reminded me a little bit of Succession uh, and the fact that like, it's very interesting to watch but like none of them are good people and none of them are somebody like, like at certain times you kind of like are finding yourselves rooting for certain people and like you like certain people in there, but they're all terrible. And like none of them are, 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 are heroes. Uh, so that's like what, what reminded me, that's kind of like what I, the vibe I got when he started talking about Tekken and like the fact that like Katsuyo was not a, uh, a hero. It was actually making me think of billions. So uh, billions <laughs> we're like in the same world, but I was thinking of how yeah, it's really easy for all of us to cheer for the Robin Hood types when we don't have money. And I'm sure anybody out there who actually has money is like, oh, F that guy. Like, he's stealing from the rich and screw him. And like, the mm -hmm. rich work hard for their money and, and blah, blah, blah. It just made me think of that here because I was, uh, as I was watching this, I was like, God, like, we're sitting here like, fuck yeah, Robin Hood. Like, take it from him. Like, go for yeah. it. And we're so cheering for them. But I was sitting here thinking, because we are rewatching Billions at the moment, and I was like, I bet none of those people in Billions would cheer for this character mm -hmm. because they are all so disgustingly rich. And and I really hope somebody on that level is cheering for these guys too. Mm -hmm. Because I just think that's, you need Robin Hoods in the world. Uh, random tangent here, since we're talking about Billions. Uh, <laughs> I, when I was a doing Lyft driving and Uber driving, um, like, Billions was it had just come out. Maybe it was season one or season two, and like there's a big po uh, billboard uh, with billions on it, and the guy, uh, one of the passengers in the back, goes, "Oh, what's that show? Bill Ions." <laughs> <laughs> so, and then he, I think he like quickly realized it, or his friend said, "Like, that's like that's billions." Uh, that's and it's like okay, oh, he's like oh shit. Uh, but I, I will always think of it as Bill Ions now. <laughs> Bill Ions, yes. Uh, anyways. Um, if you're watching with us on Patreon, we're going to continue this next week. And if you're watching with us on YouTube, we're going to do a quick costume change and then go into the next part, which is Tekken 2 and 3, I believe. Yes, we are. Yeah, the Heihachi. So two years have passed since the original Tekken, and Kazuya is now on top of the world. But like I said before, this man is not a good guy. His goal is world domination, and he uses the Zaibatsu in all kinds of nefarious ways to achieve that. Assassinations, drug dealing, kidnappings. The guy acquires all kinds of assets to build his empire. He even abducts Russian scientist Dr. Boskanovich and forces him to work on some pretty weird shit. <laughs> I don't know how or why Kazuya comes up with this. I only know that it was him and not his father. So he tells the Zaibatsu, I want you to poach as many animals as you can. Cheetahs, wolves, kangaroos. I don't oh want my. just an army of people. I want an army of beasts. And so through some mad science, Dr. Boskovitz <laughs> creates the Close. first transgenic <laughs> military animal, Roger. A boxing kangaroo that's meant to impose fear in the enemies of the Mishima Zaibatsu. Okay, nice. <laughs> now we understand. I yeah. like to imagine that because Boskanovich was a hostage, that maybe this was his way of messing with them. But <laughs> even still, you don't get this far without supervision. 
It's pretty hard to take Kazuya seriously when his big plan to conquer the world is to sick boxing kangaroos against his enemies. <laughs> But it gets even better because the second military animal would come from an extinct species. Using DNA pulled from fossilized insects, Voskanovich then applies his experiment to a full grown velociraptor. Mm -hmm. The man literally brought back the dinosaurs Jurassic just so Park. he could slap one with boxing gloves. <laughs> I mean, shit, man. You think resurrecting dinos would earn you a pretty sizable chunk of change, but hey, what do I know? Now these Seems two like characters are with the very gloves. jokey inclusions, but believe it or not, their existence is critical. Just absolutely hmm. crucial to paving the way for the future. For Kazuya's animal poaching has caught the attention of the WWWC, a wildlife protection mm. agency of which a certain woman is a member. That woman being Jun Kazama. If you have any passing knowledge of tech and lore, you know what that means. If Kazuya hadn't tried to create military kangaroos, Jin Kazama would never have been born. <laughs> ah. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In order to establish his dominance to the world, as well as eliminate his enemies, Kazuya decides to sponsor the King of Iron Fist Tournament 2. It attracts the attention of the exact same cast from the original, as well as a few new faces like the Hong Kong detective Lei Wu Lan, a Taekwondo fighter named Beck, and a Muay Thai fighter named Bruce, the latter a bodyguard for Kazuya alongside Ganryu and Anna Williams. But hark! Be careful to anyone who dares enter this tournament, for it is rumored that Kazuya has made a deal with the devil himself. His father? Mm. <laughs> what I find interesting when you look at the promotional material of this game is how the roles are reversed. Whereas before, the entire cast was surrounding Kazuya, now they find themselves surrounding Heihachi. Hmm. The hero is now the villain, the villain is now the hero. Hmm. How many sequels managed to pull that off? It once again solidifies how fluid Tekken's morality is. Heihachi's not a good guy, no. but he might be better than Kazuya. <laughs> Either way, a lot of the stakes seem much more personal this time around. Yoshimitsu wants to save Dr. Boskanovich. Kuma wants revenge on Paul Phoenix. King has become a drunk because his orphanage is going under, and only with the oh. support of Armor King can he pick himself up. One of the Jack units wants to feel emotion and identity, and actually saves a little girl named Jane from a war-torn battle. It vows mm -hmm. to protect the little girl no matter what. Michelle's mother has been kidnapped by the Zaibatsu because of a certain medallion she has. A medallion that will serve a much bigger purpose in Tekken 3. And while she's dealing with that, she also has to be careful of Ganryu because the sumo wrestler has been madly in love with Michelle <laughs> since meeting her in the last tournament. Apparently, he begged Kazuya to rig the game so that they would fight each other. Lee Chowlan decides to side with his stepbrother Kazuya, although it's not because of brotherly love. Ultimately, he wants to sabotage his plans with the help of Wang Jinrei. Hmm. And Heihachi, well, the man has a lot of pride. He has spent the last two years training like a beast, knowing that his son has finally lived up to the Mishima name. He will not take him lightly this time. The stage is set, the King of Iron Fist Tournament 2 begins. So right off the bat, Paul defeats Kuma again. Aww. Heihachi faces off with Lee Chowlan and puts him in his place. He tells his adopted son that when I get the Zaibatsu back, your ass is out. Ooh. Michelle defeats Ganryu, telling the guy, sorry, buddy, I'm not interested. <laughs> she also gets her mother back, as well as the medallion. Good. Lei Wulan faces off with Bruce and emerges victorious. Lei found information connecting Bruce to the death of his not old much. partner, but when he tries mm -hmm. to pursue him after the tournament, Bruce's getaway plane crashes and he supposedly dies. Mm. Nina Williams enters the tournament to assassinate Kazuya, and whether she got defeated by him or by Anna, it's not very clear. The point is that she suffers defeat, and Kazuya, being the absolute shithead that crazy he is, outfit that I forces her into a yeah. cryosleep chamber. He renders her unconscious to forever be a human test subject. Ooh. It's at this point that Anna realizes that she doesn't want to live in a world without Nina, and so she asks to be put in cryosleep as well. <laughs> and Kazuya's just like, uh... All right, whatever, I don't care. <laughs> the Williams sisters together forever. <laughs> but whatever cryo research is gonna happen, it'll happen without Dr. Boskanovich, because Yoshimitsu accomplishes his mission when he boards a helicopter that the good doctor is on. He takes out the guards and makes off with the scientist, slowly disembarking with his artificial propeller arm. I'm very popular, y'all! 
Meanwhile, Jack, one of Boskanovich's creations, is playing with the little girl Jane while something sinister happens overhead. A giant space cannon designed by a scientist named Dr. Abel aims specifically for oh. the one Jack unit that's competing in the tournament. It fires off a giant laser that pierces mm -hmm. Jack's neck oh. and shuts the machine down. Jane, traumatized over losing her friend, dedicates the rest of her life to studying robotics. Now, I don't know how well Jun Kazama did in the tournament. All I know is that she met with Kazuya. And she's not just a wildlife protector. She's not just a martial artist. There is something about the Kazama bloodline that allows them to feel the spirits and energy all around them. Mm. And when she meets Kazuya, she senses a sinister force, an evil aura that seems to be controlling his destiny. Almost like he's a good man, but there's some element that makes him do the evil that he does. And Kazuya, for maybe? whatever reason, <laughs> is drawn to Jun. He finds her mysterious, her interest in him very intriguing. The two get close, very close. And at some point during the tournament, they the two have sex. Yeah, these two should absolutely hate each other, but you know what they say, opposites attract. This is a PS1 fighting game. Oh, there are no scenes to elaborate on. Unless Tekken 8 or the Netflix anime series want to explain how this happened, you just have to take my word that Jun and Kazuya hit it off. <laughs> Jun doesn't make much of an impact in the tournament. Hell, she doesn't even make it to the semifinals. No, that honor belongs to Heihachi and goddamn Paul Phoenix again. Hmm. Yeah, for the second year in a row, he got that close to winning, but this time around, a gigantic traffic accident clogged up the expressway, and Paul was unable to reach his match in time. Oh, that sucks. Loss by disqualification. Paul, dude, this is why you show up early, man. Come on. Mm -hmm. And so it ends like it did before with Heihachi and Kazuya. And during the fight, Heihachi discovers the evil force that Jun had sensed because this is where players first get introduced to Devil Kazuya. He sheds his clothes yeah. to become a purple devil man hmm. who can fly around and shoot lasers out of his forehead. And this isn't the result of one of Boskanovich's experiments. This is a natural part of Kaz's being that's been there since the very beginning. The hmm. Devil Gene, a strange mutation that allows him to transform into a completely different being but he doesn't keep his consciousness as the devil is its own person. Devil Kazuya has mm. a will of its own and a completely different ambitions compared to its host. The devil only exists to kill, to destroy, to cause all kinds of pain and suffering. It should also be mentioned that there's an angel in this game as well. Some kind of good side to Kazuya that acts as the final boss when you play as the devil. She only appears in Tekken 2 and aside from the tag spinoffs, she never comes back or gets referred to ever. Hmm. But in case you were curious, Kazuya's good side is depicted as a blonde white woman. So hey. <laughs> but none of this matters. <laughs> Devil or no, laser beams or no, Heihachi Mishima is the strongest man in the world and he will air juggle your ass. <laughs> Even with the scary demonic power, Kazuya loses to his father. Heihachi regains the Mishima Zaibatsu and once again proves his dominance and thus he aims to rectify a mistake he made over 23 years ago. He shouldn't have thrown Kazuya into a ravine. Instead, he, he should have thrown him into a volcano. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he picks up Kaz's unconscious body and chucks it into molten lava. Oh then he God. flies away by helicopter while the damn thing erupts in the background. <laughs> Kazuya Mishima is dead. Heihachi does not fuck around. Nope, seriously. With the devil taken care of and things returning to normal, the only trace of Kazuya left is his child. One that will be raised by Jun Kazama. Tekken 3 is a turning point for the series in many ways. On the gameplay side, this is when it started getting really good. Faster combat, more fluidity, it all feels drastically better than the two games that came before it. And everyone took notice, which is why Tekken 3 is often considered one of the greatest PlayStation games ever made. But in terms of lore, this game changed the tone, the visual style, and even the time frame. Tekken 3 hmm. takes place 18 years after Tekken 2, where once wow. Heihachi had black hair, he now has gray hair. Where once we followed Kazuya, 
we now follow his son. A new generation of fighters, a new era to unfold. A new energy had entered the franchise and it has been intoxicating ever since. So the story kicks off in South America where an ancient evil awakens from some ruins. This evil is the god of fighting known as Ogre. Its origins are shrouded in mystery with some theorizing that it was dropped on this planet by extraterrestrials. It speaks a weird language, it's a big muscular green man, and the only thing it lives for is absorbing chi of other fighters. I don't know how martial artist energies differ from ours, but Ogre does. And with the ability to sense this power, he travels all over the globe to battle. And this actually leads to casualties as Ogre finds King the Mexican wrestler and actually kills him. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, Did you think King in Tekken 7 was the same King in Tekken 1? No way, Jose. Ogre beats the Taekwondo fighter Beck so badly that the dude ends up in a coma until Tekken 5. Martial artists from all over the world start disappearing, leading to Detective Lei Wu Lan to open up a case for it. But by far, the biggest target of Ogres is Jun Kazama. Mm. Ever since Tekken 2, Jun has been raising her son Jin in Yakushima, and she's trained him in martial arts, she's taught him good values, the importance of morality. But now something's coming. Because Jun can sense evil energies, she warns Jin that if anything ever happens to her, he needs to seek out his grandfather, Heihachi. And sure enough, Ogre shows up, trashes the place, and knocks Jin unconscious. When he comes to, both Ogre and his mother are gone. Aside from the non-canon tag games, Jun never comes back. Heihachi is intrigued Damn. by this Ogre. Mm -hmm. He's always heard of it, but now the beast has finally woken up. If he could capture Ogre, study his body, study outfit. his blood, perhaps Heihachi could unlock that strength for himself. And Jin, his grandson, a chip off the old block. He takes to Mishima-style karate very well, convincing Heihachi that he would make for the perfect bait to draw Ogre out. And naturally, Jin is fueled with hate, fueled with revenge, desperate to fight Ogre once more. This would eventually lead to Heihachi starting the King of Iron Fist Tournament 3. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. He still takes care of Jin and puts him in high school. The Mishima Polytechnic High School, to be exact. A facility that not only has framed pictures of Heihachi everywhere, but also a giant golden statue so that the students can worship him like a god. Wow. <laughs> Again, I find Heihachi so damn fascinating because the guy is just so in love with himself. Mm -hmm. Anyone who can win the King of Iron Fist is given a trophy that is modeled after his own head. <laughs> the dude literally has a bowling alley in the Zaibatsu headquarters with these trophies as the bowling pins. I tell you, I would love to have Heihachi as my grandpa. <laughs> and I'm not the only one, as Jin goes to school with Ling Xiaoyu, a Chinese girl who's distantly related to Wang Jinrei. One day, she stows aboard a yacht belonging to the Mishima Zaibatsu, and despite being a teenager, she single-handedly kicks all of the guards' asses. <laughs> nice. Heihachi finds this so impressive and so amusing that he agrees to take her as a ward, enrolling her into his school. And as a gesture of good faith, he also gives her a bodyguard. Panda! Specifically, a panda bear that knows Mishima-style karate. <laughs> I, 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 why a panda bear? There's gotta be better and easier ways to give Xiaoyu protection, you know? This is the second time Heihachi's raised a bear. Yep. Actually, no, sorry, I have to scratch that. With the time jump, the original Kuma passed away of natural causes. I know, Aww. that's sad, right? Mm -hmm. But don't worry, because Kuma had a baby cub, and that bear is also named Kuma. Sweet. Yeah, Heihachi isn't a very creative person, especially <laughs> when you realize that Kuma is the Japanese word for bear. <laughs> Kuma may as well be exactly the same as his dad, down to the rivalry with Paul Phoenix. Although there is one difference. He's in love. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> Nice! Yes, Kuma is in love with Panda, who always rejects his advances. <laughs> but I believe in him. One day he'll win her over. Besides being Xiaoyu's best friend, Panda is also her method of transportation. And this bear must have a rocket cool. jet up her ass because holy shit, 
Panda runs about as fast as Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> I just can't with this series sometimes. <laughs> Jin Kazama has done his fair share of fighting, though, and this earns him the rivalry of Warang. Warang is a Taekwondo fighter who served under Beck from Tekken 2. But with his master hospitalized because of Ogre, the kid's gotta let out his frustration somehow. He and Jin once battled each other to a draw, much like Kazuya and Paul before them. And you can bet that these two will be seeing more of each other as the series goes on. Eddie Gordo, ugh, oh, one of the coolest characters ever. Tekken 3 was my introduction to Capoeira. I had never seen anyone fight with dancing flair before. It was just so damn unique. Eddie was sent to prison years ago for the murder of his That's father, cool a crime he didn't Different commit. And... While behind mm -hmm. bars, he met a Capoeira master who agreed to teach Eddie everything he knew. Once he gets out of prison, he seeks out the Mishima Zaibatsu to help him find his father's killers. Brian Fury, oh man, this guy's a nut job. Originally a corrupt name, police though. officer mm -hmm. in Hong Kong, Brian was killed when he got involved in a shootout. Dead, finito, deceased. That is until his body was recovered by Dr. Abel, the creepy scientist that took out Jack. If Boskanovich is the Dr. Light, then Abel is the Dr. Wily. Always feeling underappreciated by comparison, he vows to create the ultimate bad science that nobody can deny. And so he resurrects Brian with a cyborg body, all in the hopes of perfecting an army of super soldiers. As a cyborg, Brian Fury is damn near invincible. Bullets bounce off the guy. He can shrug off artillery from a tank. The dude is now so strong, he can lift incredibly heavy objects and swing them around like it's Super Mario 64. <laughs> Becoming a cyborg was the greatest thing that ever happened to the guy, because what Brian enjoys most is fighting. The thrill of battle, the satisfaction of killing. When he wins a match in Tekken, he actually pummels the shit out of his downed opponent. <laughs> oh, this guy has no chill, and if you see him in a dark alleyway, you'd be wise to get the hell out of there. No the universe of Tekken works in mysterious ways. Ever since Ogre awakened and went on a rampage, another being came to life as well. Mokujin. Mokujin is a 2000 year old training dummy whose entire motivation is to eliminate Ogre. This is a unique fighter in that it mimics every other fighting style in the game, switching out how it plays every single round. I want to say that Mokujin is just a comic relief character because all of its endings are very strange. Like apparently Mokujin has a giant big breasted wife who mistreats him badly, <laughs> forcing him on errands in a live action forest. Also, he loves playing Tekken 3, yes. which is an arcade in this forest. <laughs> Duh. In one ending, he literally visits the Bandai Namco headquarters for a tour, flirting with all of the ladies who work there. All of this is canon, goddammit! <laughs> and rounding off the roster, there's a few returning characters, but also a lot of new generation types. Instead of having martial law, we now have his son, Forest Law. Although, you know what's weird about that? From Tekken 4 onwards, Marshall returns to enter the tournaments, and Forrest doesn't. They establish <laughs> that the son fights exactly like the dad, and then they go, eh, you know what? We like the dad better. <laughs> King's okay. still in the game, but it's obviously a different person. It's a boy who grew up in the original King's orphanage, mentored by Armor King to be his replacement. Michelle has retired from fighting, but she taught everything she knows to her adopted daughter, Julia. Julia's goal is to reforest her land when all of a sudden the Mishima Zaibatsu kidnap Michelle and the medallion she recovered in Tekken that 2. Damn medallion again. It turns out that this object that got Michelle's father killed apparently has the power to control Ogre. I'm oh. not sure if Heihachi ever figured out how to use it. Remember Jane, the little girl that Jack saved? Well, after 18 years of learning robotics, she manages to install Jack's consciousness into a new experimental body, thus creating Gun Jack. The Williams sisters finally wake up from their cryo sleep. Apparently, they sensed Ogre's presence and it jolted them awake. Very peculiar. Anna came out fine, but Nina emerges with amnesia. Other than her fighting and assassination skills, she doesn't remember anything about the person she used to be. Hmm. What was the cryo machine's purpose anyway? The reason it was created in the first place was so that Dr. Boskanovich could find the solution to eternal life. Something he was desperate to acquire after losing his daughter Alyssa to an unexpected illness. Keep that in mind for the future. 
Yoshimitsu is looking to collect Ogre's blood to help with Botskana's oh, deteriorating health, a plot hmm. point that is all but forgotten in Tekken 4 <laughs> onwards. And last but not least, okay. Paul Phoenix is back mm -hmm. at the ripe old age of 46, and he's looking to get the glory he could never attain. So yeah, folks, that's the roster. The stage is set, Heihachi announces the King of Iron Fist Tournament 3, and I guess Ogre's just gonna show up. <laughs> See, I've always wondered how exactly this whole thing works. The assumption is that the gathering of fighters will attract Ogre to them, but the final match also takes place in the temple that he came from. Is it empty? Is Ogre sleeping in there? Is the green monster man honoring the results of the tournament? Or does he coincidentally show up at the finals? I'd like to imagine that Heihachi used Michelle's medallion to control him, but it also asks the question of why have a fighting tournament at all? Maybe that Netflix Tekken series will help explain this a lot better. All you need to know is that it's a video game ass video game and <laughs> Ogre's the final boss. So first up, Paul Phoenix defeats Kuma again. again. <laughs> Seriously, this is getting to be a broken record, but this is constantly established in Kuma's backstories. These bears just can't catch a break. Jin Kazama defeats his rival Warang. To be honest, this isn't outright confirmed, but going by the wording of Warang's Tekken 4 prologue and his attitude in his non-canon ending, it just seems like they definitely battled each other. But of course, I could be wrong. At some point, Julia manages to rescue her mother Michelle, and Eddie Gordo discovers that the man who killed his father was none other than the late Kazuya Mishima. Oh, and at some point, Dr. Abel activates his space cannon again in the hopes of trying to kill Gun Jack like he did Jack 2. Dick. And this ending's kind of interesting. If you watch it as is in the Tekken 7 menus today, you're getting the bad ending. The ending where Abel nukes the area so badly that it kills both Gun Jack and Jane. For whatever reason, Tekken 3 gave Gunjack two endings, because if you beat the story mode a second time, the same ending will play out, except this time around, Gunjack spawns a force field that protects the two of them just fine. Oh, nice. I don't know okay. what the logic was there, but someone behind Tekken 7 obviously didn't know this, as only the bad ending is viewable. Hmm. And uh, that's about it. There's not much to go off of reading material from future games. The details of the tournament seem pretty ambiguous. But we definitely know how it ends. The final battle takes place in the South American ruins. It's Ogre versus... Paul Phoenix? Yeah! Paul manages what? to hang in there until he comes face to face with the monster itself. It's a fierce fight between the two competitors, but there can only be one winner. And that winner was Paul Phoenix! Nice! I'm not kidding, that's actually the lore! Paul went undefeated through the entire King of Iron Fist Tournament 3 and even triumphed over Ogre. The monster that killed King, that killed Jun, that put Beck in the hospital, the big bad of Tekken 3 taken out by the ultimate underdog. Hmm. Incredible. Nowadays, Paul Phoenix finds himself as a bit of a comic relief character, hmm. always being put into silly situations. But in the 90s, this dude consistently made it to the finals of every single tournament, being on equal terms with both Kazuya and Ogre. I love this aspect because sometimes it gets kind of boring seeing the same main characters take the crown. And Paul getting so damn close when he has nothing to do with them, that's the chaos I live for. <laughs> but I have to burst the bubble and explain why he didn't win the tournament. You Aww. see, Ogre actually has two forms, and while Paul celebrated over beating the first, he didn't stick around to actually see the beast transform. Oh no. And thus, uh -oh. Ogre becomes True Ogre, a gigantic winged snake armed fire breathing abomination that Jin Kazama takes on. Ooh. Now Tekken 4 says that Paul was undefeated, so I have to wonder if he actually battled Heihachi and Jin, or if Ogre interfered before Paul could take Jin on. Either way, Jin gets the ultimate victory. You win. <laughs> Ogre disintegrates into goop and Jin Kazama has avenged his mother. He has won the King of Iron Fist Tournament 3. Too bad he won't be allowed to enjoy the victory. Oh no! Jesus Christ! Not only is Heihachi a shitty father, he's a shitty grandpa too. Yeah. With Ogre defeated, Jin is no longer any use to him. Just another blood relative getting ready to knock him off his perch. Plus, 
This is Kazuya's son, which means there's a very good chance that this kid has some devilish tricks up his sleeve. Hmm. And well, that's a story for another day. Nice. You gotta love how Heihachi was thrown head first through a thick stone wall, was spiked into the ground from a massive fall, and the dude just gets up like it's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Jin Kazama definitely has the devil gene. And now he's on the run, not just from Heihachi, but also his dad. Mm. That's what you think? What a fucked up family. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's always what I think when I walk away from a Tekken, Tekken, like, lore video yeah. or trailer or anything. It's just, Jesus Christ, this family. Um, I like, I mean, I think of all of them, I like Jin the best. Well, yeah. Jin's mother. Okay. Well, yeah. Uh, you know, and then him being a product of her and raised by her, I hope that she has rubbed off on him. But, like, mm -hmm. she's the badass ninja who's trying to save the animals and everything so she's my favorite of course it almost seemed like they had Jin uh because on oh, this game because they're like all right well the two main guys so far like neither of them are likable we had them both win and both lose and it's just like but neither of them are someone you can root for so maybe we'll try to get a character that you can root for a little bit more with uh with Jin um I love the uh Trying to find like the ultimate weapon and it being like a kangaroo with boxing gloves on it, like and then the raptor with boxing gloves on it. But um, you know, like I'm just like like I said, it's already got the talons in it. Like you're taking away its weapon and then just like you're like dulling it with the boxing gloves. Um, yeah, I don't think a Velociraptor's power was ever in its little forearms. Yeah. <laughs> so sure, put the gloves on that. I'm sure that's going to do a lot. Yeah, and the other thing, and the Williams sisters are also hilarious. Yeah. Like, Nina gets frozen and Anna's like. Okay, yeah, me too. I want to do that. Like, give me the uh, cryogenic freezing. Treatment. But I mean, like, she's not just frozen. She's being tortured while cryogenic yeah. is frozen. And still, Anna signs up for that. Um, that is that is a level of sisterly devotion that I will never know or understand. Nope, nope. I like the way they told the story in this in this video. Kind of like balancing a lot of the darker family drama, but with the humor of the raptor and the yeah, kangaroo. Yeah. Like Heihachi's son is a dick. Mm -hmm. But it all really starts with Heihachi because you kind of wonder, well, if Heihachi hadn't thrown him off a cliff, yeah. would he have grown up to be this irreparably damaged as a person? Um, so I, I just find the whole story, the whole family fascinating in like a twisted kind of, car wreck way where it's like mm -hmm. it's kind of like succession for anybody who's watched yep. succession it's like this family is totally and irreversibly effed up and you know that you shouldn't like watch it because it feels invasive and none of your business and like you shouldn't enjoy it on an entertainment level uh but you also can't look away and that's kind of what this family is like. So uh, we're going to continue on with the uh, next uh, Tekken, Tekken 4 and 5. Um, and if you're watching this on Patreon, it's going to be next week. And if you're watching this on YouTube, it's going to be right now. Yeah, right now. I personally love Tekken 4. I know it's the black sheep on a competitive level, but in terms of atmosphere and music and overall presentation, I always thought this game was amazing. It was the first entry to start having prologues before a character's story, and that saves me a world of research. <laughs> Everything I told you about Tekken's 1 through 3 required me reading instruction manuals, strategy guides, and the wiki. Lots of research to do, whereas now we've got definitive storytelling. Thank God. So two years have passed since the defeat of Ogre. Jin Kazama has been hiding in Brisbane, Australia, where he's been unlearning Heihachi's teachings. Because Jin now loathes the Mishima bloodline and everything associated with it. Heihachi has been searching for him this whole entire time. You see, even though the Zaibatsu recovered Ogre's body, he can't actually use its power without one key ingredient. The Devil Gene. Of course. Without his grandson, there's just nothing he can do. But one day, the Zaibatsu brings him brand new information about G Corporation, a biotech firm that deals in genetic research. 
It turns out that after the King of Iron Fist Tournament 2, they recovered Kazuya's body from the volcano. <laughs> How did they know to find him in there? Was Heihachi just yeah. bragging to everyone he knew? Like, yeah, I threw my bitch-ass son in there. It was <laughs> awesome. But if the company has Kazuya's body, that means Heihachi can steal it and get the devil gene. So he sends in the Tekken Force, the Zaibatsu's military squad, to ransack the G Corporation building. They bust in, dispose of the scientists, steal all kinds of data like it's nothing. Until they don't. Because all of a sudden, one man single-handedly kicks their ass. We killed him. Oof. Oh yeah, mad science rears its ugly head again because the G Corporation actually brought this fucker back from the dead. <laughs> Not only that, but they also performed various experiments on Kazuya over the years, helping him discover a way to unify the devil gene, hmm. to eliminate the other persona and gain complete control. Bad day for Heihachi, but this presents an opportunity. Heihachi announces the king of Iron Fist Tournament 4, and instead of just getting a trophy, the winner will gain control of the Mishima Zaibatsu itself. Ah, damn! Kazuya definitely recognizes this for the trap that it is, but gladly participates anyway. And Jin, upon hearing of both the tournament and his father's survival, also rushes in to eliminate his family for good. Certainly no love loss for his evil father. Hmm. But yeah, Tekken 4's got a lot going on in this story, with only three of the characters being new. Instead of having Eddie Gordo, we have Christy Montero. She is the okay. granddaughter of the Capoeira master who taught Eddie how to fight. After Iron Fist 3, Eddie passed this knowledge on to her, making her gameplay damn near identical. When Eddie leaves to confront his father's killer, she chases after by entering the tournament. And then there's Craig Marduk, a Valley Tudo cage fighter. Oh. This guy was on top of the mixed martial arts world. But then one now day the he got caught in some kind of scandal, and with public shame comes bitterness and resentment. Marduk is an angry motherfucker. He <laughs> takes what he wants, and no one will deny him. Oh yeah, baby, that's what I'm talking about. You need to get with me, girl. Kick his ass. Uh, I am not into Neanderthals. Oh. Oh. I always get what I want. <laughs> oh. uh, I'm sure he'll wait for Anna to wake up and politely ask again for consent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, his attitude boils over one day at the bar when he picks a fight with someone and murders them. Ooh. This gets him sent to prison. He'd be serving a much longer sentence if not for some mysterious benefactor. One who manages to pay off the judiciaries and invites Marduk to Iron Fist 4. Mm. Who is this benefactor? It's King. For you see, the man that Marduk murdered was actually Armor King. Yes! Armor King is dead and his apprentice wants revenge. He enters the tournament hell-bent on destroying his master's killer. Steve okay. Fox is a young British boxer with a weird scar on his arm. He was adopted as a kid and doesn't remember his childhood. One day he refused to throw a fight for a mafia group known as the Syndicate. He flees to America, but eventually grows frustrated from all the subterfuge. Rather than live his life in fear, he chooses to join Iron Fist 4. Naturally, that puts him in the spotlight, and so the Syndicate hires an assassin to murder the man at the tournament. That assassin being Nina Williams, who still hasn't regained her memory. But she'll have to watch out for Lei Wu Lan, whose new case involves bringing down the Syndicate. Li Chao Lan's evolution has always been fascinating to me. Hmm. See, this guy was kicked out of the Zaibatsu for siding with Kazuya, a guy he really doesn't like. And at first, he was kind of bitter about that, but then Li decides to turn his life around. He adopts a new persona, becoming Violet, the CEO of Violet Systems. This company creates robots from housekeepers to fighting machines. Li believes them to be the future. And this move pays off wrong. because the guy ends up as a playboy billionaire living in a mansion in the Bahamas. I got to imagine the <laughs> thing that attracts all the ladies is his gigantic cock. Holy moly, even John Holmes would be jealous of this guy. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I swear to god, I didn't edit that image. 
That is real. <laughs> but I love the changing wow. of expectations here. Okay. So you'd expect him to be a rich fuckboy, the dickhead rival Heihachi yeah. always wanted him to be. <laughs> but instead, Lee is really chill. He's always siding with the good guys. He's always being courteous and lovely. <laughs> the guy has a catchphrase now. Excellent. 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 <laughs> Anyway, he enters the tournament to help demonstrate the capabilities of Combot, a machine he designed that can copy any fighting style. This mm. thing is a playable character and operates exactly like Mokujin did. Paul Phoenix did defeat Ogre, but since he left before its final form, he was not recognized as the winner of the last tournament. Paul becomes bitter, despondent, and even hated as his fans get tired of his whining. <laughs> the dude's dojo goes under and he's basically living Aww. in the streets. He enters the tournament to once again prove the critics wrong. And his buddy Martial Law isn't doing much better as the guy's restaurant goes bankrupt competing with another restaurant chain. And this basically becomes the guy's constant struggle. Every single tournament from this point onwards, Law is always desperately competing for cash. Oh. That's all I have to say. Kuma was not happy about losing to Paul Phoenix, so he figured to get his animal instinct back he needed to leave the cushy comfort of the Zaibatsu <laughs> and return to the wilderness. And out there, he gets that edge a bear like him is supposed to have. Brian Fury loves being a cyborg, but unfortunately, he has a very tiny lifespan. His body is deteriorating, and only Dr. Abel, who is now working for the Mishima Zaibatsu, can possibly save him. He enters the tournament to get closer to his creator. Julia invested money into G Corporation because they were the only company willing to help reforest her land. But after the Zaibatsu raided their labs, the reforestation data disappeared with them. She enters to get it back. And with that, the stage is set. It's a lot of setup, but this game has a lot of story. So first up, I have to assume that Paul Phoenix defeated Steve Fox. In Tekken 5, we get artwork depicting this, and there's no way that Paul could have lost. Steve might have faced off with Nina beforehand, but there's no real evidence to say that. But now it's time for another crazy reveal. <laughs> Lei Wulan comes to Steve with information that he found in the Zaibatsu's mainframe. And this is bombshell stuff. Basically, Heihachi was trying to absorb Ogre's power, but he had to do a lot of experimenting to get results. And what makes better test subjects than children? But oh. Heihachi doesn't abduct children. Oh, no, 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 no. Instead, he takes advantage of the cryo chambers he's come back to and impregnates Nina Williams through in vitro fertilization. Oh. oh yeah, Steve is Nina's lab baby. And the kid was experimented on by creepo doctors like it's some kind of horror show. And you know, when you remember that Anna was also in cryo sleep, yeah. it really makes you wonder if she's got a kid out there too. Good Lord. When the Syndicate briefs <sighs> Nina on her target, she finds this surprising and decides to give up on the mission. But she's not exactly broken up over this. She doesn't try to talk to Steve. Hell, she willingly works with Heihachi later, reinforcing her cold, detached nature. To her, it's just business, nothing hmm. personal. Afterwards, Lei Wulan would take down the Syndicate for good. King faces off with Marduk and absolutely destroys him. Nice. But it's still not enough. King follows Marduk into the hospital where he plans to end his life for good. But as he's about to deliver the killing blow, he notices the cage fighter's belongings on the table. God and seeing that photo of Marduk's family made King realize that if he were to go through with this, he would be no better. It's a pretty good scene, as long as you can take the Jaguar part seriously. <laughs> Brian Fury ends up meeting with Dr. Abel, but unfortunately for the bad doctor, his ass gets punched so hard that his body <laughs> makes a giant crack in the wall. Considering oh Brian's entire motivation for entering this tournament was to extend his lifespan, I'm not really sure why he did this. Brian loves being a cyborg. The guy would be dead otherwise. So what gives? Brian falls unconscious after this punch, but Yoshimitsu, oh yeah, Yoshi's in this game, ends up finding him. He takes Brian to the Manji clan's headquarters, where the good Dr. Boskanovich tells him that he will absolutely help. Well, ain't that nice of him. I wonder how Brian will repay the favor. <laughs> but it should be mentioned that Dr. Abel never comes back. He's not in Tekken 5, not in <laughs> Tekken 6, and when he does get a mention in Tekken 7, it's in the past tense, referring to the late Doctor's legacy. 
He's absolutely dead, so I have to make assumptions. Aside from winning the tournament, Brian's ending is absolutely canon, so there's no reason to assume that he didn't destroy Abel. Kinda surprising, I figured they would have kept that character around. For the fourth time in a row, Paul Phoenix faces off with Kuma. And Kuma loses well, again. technically the second, but you know what I mean. But wallowing in misery can't compare to training in the wilderness. Kuma does what his father nice. couldn't and defeats Paul Phoenix. Go and Kuma! Last, right? I guess he's not that much of a joke character if he can beat the man who beat Ogre. <laughs> Lee ends up facing off with Kazuya, but the playboy is still no match for his stepbrother. He and Fire. Combat both suffer defeat. With victory over Lee, Kaz is all set to face off with his son, Jin Kazama. Mm. But unfortunately, the kid doesn't show up and ends up disqualified from the tournament. And that's because Heihachi sicked the Tekken Force onto him, where they proceed to drug and capture the lad. Thus, the final battle is a three-peat, as it's once again between Kazuya and Heihachi. Interesting thing about this encounter. When you play as any of the non-Mishimas, Heihachi is typically the final boss. Now, when he's facing off with Kazuya, he wears his traditional black gi. But with anyone else, he always enters the arena in a fundoshi. After all, Heihachi is a warrior's warrior. Okay. He doesn't want any tricks. He doesn't need assistance. He wants to fight completely naked. <laughs> the only problem is that it's incredibly revealing. Heihachi's bare ass is staring the player right in the face. <laughs> Look at that thing. The string is riding right up his ass crack. I can practically see his taints. Oh. I don't mean to be disrespectful to Japanese culture, it's like but he's good lord. Am yeah. I a gamer or a proctologist? <laughs> <laughs> So after a tough bout, believe it or not, Heihachi once again defeats Kazuya. I know, right? After that amazing opening, after all those years of wanting revenge, mm -hmm. and the old man still pulls it off. Heihachi is the official winner of the King of Iron Fist Tournament 4. Oh. But the old man's not done, and he tells Kaz that he can lead him to Jin. So the two travel deep into the Zaibatsu compound to a temple in the forest known as Hanmaru. There, Kazuya finds Jin tied up in chains, which couldn't be more perfect. The devil takes over Kazuya once again and explains that when Jun and Kaz got together, a part of himself went away into the body of Jin. Hence why he has the devil gene. But now's the time to take that power back. Or so the devil thinks because the 20 years of research that Kazuya has done has helped teach him how to unify this power. Fighting from within, Kazuya eliminates the devil persona completely, incorporating it into his own being. There is no devil anymore, only Kazuya. Ah, oh, sweet, he's a good guy now, right? No. <laughs> no. Oh, don't be silly. Kaz may be in control, but he still wants the same thing, huh. the power to conquer the world. I find it, I get it. So Jin and Kazuya battle each other for the first time ever. Oh, a nice. A double gene clash between father and son. And in the end, Jin Kazama proves his strength by beating his old man. Yeah. But that's when Heihachi takes advantage and picks a fight too. <sighs> but this kid is so damn talented, he disposes both of the Mishimas at the Sweet. exact same time. The chance to rid the world of this menace is finally here. <laughs> Jin flies away from Hanmaru, leaving his vengeance behind. His father, his grandfather, Good they get to live for another day. Well, at least one of them does. <laughs> Immediately after Jin leaves, the temple gets bombarded by jack robots belonging to the G Corporation. The company has betrayed Kazuya and is now looking to dispose of him as well as Heihachi. <laughs> Team up, let's fucking go! <laughs> opening to Tekken 5 is one of the greatest that's ever existed. Just Kaz and Heihachi kicking all kinds of robot ass as the most badass tag team ever. Yeah. For a while, anyway. 
<laughs> Dick move, Kazuya! Dude makes his getaway as the jacks pile on. Damn. Did you see a body? Exactly. Okay, Blade. Yeah, right? Ugh, that's so badass. But yeah, folks, Heihachi Mishima is dead. Are we sure? Super dead. Never coming back. <laughs> Unless you immediately start playing as either Kazuya or Raven in this game. Because you'll be watching the cutscenes and, oh, never mind. There he is. <laughs> Heihachi is playable in Tekken 5, so the whole getting killed thing is kind of meaningless. <laughs> so, like, the Jacks blow up Hanmaru and Heihachi gets blasted from the site, just launched across the entire forest, eventually landing in a grave in a nearby cemetery. He penetrates the dirt and just lies there, and lies there, and lies there. And two months later, oh my God. Heihachi finally wakes up. Completely fine, ready to bust some heads. He's like a houseplant the on the verge of death for two months in his pot, killable. just waiting. <laughs> the guy was literally buried under dirt for months, and he didn't need to eat food or anything. I think he might secretly be a Kryptonian. But yeah, uh, interesting thing about Tekken 5. According to Tekken 6, Heihachi only woke up after Tekken 5. His entire existence is non-canon because he was never there. Which is a shame, because he missed what? out on a family reunion. For you see, the Hanmaru Temple's explosion didn't just send Heihachi and Kazuya away, it also woke someone up. The dead man that was chained up in the basement, Jinpachi Mishima. Heihachi's dad is here, damn from the dead. I alluded to this earlier, but yes, Heihachi killed his father and stole the Mishima Zaibatsu from him. But it wasn't a quick thing. He didn't just shoot him or throw him into a volcano. Instead, he chained him up in Hanmaru and made him lift a giant boulder until he eventually starved to death. Huh. Seems like an especially horrible way to die. Yeah. Bad father, bad Greek grandpa, mythology shit. terrible child. Good lord. So Jinpachi was dead until some thing took over his body and resurrected him. Hmm. It's not the devil gene. It's just some evil force that's never really elaborated on. Hmm. Seriously, beyond Lei Wulan's ending, no one talks about what's happened to him. Even the Tekken wiki is just like, it's a demonic force of unknown origins. <laughs> so, yeah. The idea that. is that this demon force is slowly taking over his body, and when it gains full control, it's going to destroy the world. So using his last ounce of humanity, Jinpachi takes control of the Mishima Zaibatsu. And two months later, he announces the King of Iron Fist Tournament 5. <laughs> because why call the military? Why kill yourself? Just get a bunch of martial artists to take you out. Dumb, dumb, dumb plot. But hey, <laughs> that's the setup for Tekken 5. Once again, the prize is the Zaibatsu itself, which intrigues Jin Kazama, who is now suffering nightmares that trigger his devil gene. Mm. His alter ego is too dangerous, and Jin can't hold it off forever. He enters the tournament to find a solution. We got another batch of newbies to talk about, one of which you've already seen. Raven. There's not much to say about him, he's a special operatives agent working for a shadowy organization. He's entered the tournament to collect information nondescript, non-specific information. <laughs> he is but one of many ravens that all serve under one leader, the aptly named Master Raven. All you need to know about Raven is that he's so cool he can stand on top of a fighter jet while it's flying at <laughs> full speed. Hell, he can stand underneath one. Those are some magnetic boots, man. Mm -hmm. Next up is Feng Wei, a Chinese Kempo fighter who wants to be the strongest man in the world. After getting into fights outside of his training, he gets scolded by his master. Naturally, Feng took that as an insult and murdered the man. <sighs> he then spends his time seeking out a scroll known as the Secrets of God Fist, something he believes will give him ultimate power. He attacks every dojo he comes across looking for the thing until it becomes clear that it's in the clutches of the Mishima Zaibatsu. He enters the tournament to retrieve it. Definitely not gonna but be his dojo for you. attacks spur another competitor, and her name is Asuka Kazama. I want to repeat that: Asuka Kazama. Kazama. 
This girl is a distant relative of Jun Kazama and the cousin of Jin Kazama. Mm. I have no idea how big the Kazama family is, but it's clearly far from gone. After Feng Wei attacks her family's dojo, the girl rushes into the tournament to get revenge. She apparently doesn't know that Jin is related to her, so I guess Jun didn't talk with the rest of her family. Next up is Lily de Rochefort, the daughter of a wealthy oil tycoon. One day she got abducted by criminals who wanted to ransom her for money. But Lily didn't go without a fight, and she managed to beat the crap out of her captor. <laughs> nice. The thrill of combat was intoxicating, so from that point onwards, she spent her time learning martial arts in secret so as not to upset her troubled father. One day she gets into a fight and defeats Forest Law, and that's when he hands her the invitation to the King of Iron Fist Tournament 5. She figures what could be better for her daddy than to obtain the Mishima Zaibatsu. You remember Roger the Boxing Kangaroo? Well, it turns out that he found a wife and the two had a baby, Aww. Roger Jr. And everything was going hunky-dory until strangers came and kidnapped the guy. <gasps> so Roger Jr., inside the pouch of his mother, enters the tournament to save his father. But let's be honest, his mom is doing all the legwork. <laughs> I guess she was genetically altered by Dr. Boskanovich too. And also, isn't it kind of dangerous to keep your child on your person when you get into fist fights with some of the deadliest warriors known to man? Yeah, probably. Your child could get fucking killed out there. <laughs> Bad kangaroo. <laughs> Bad. Xiao Yu managed to find out the Mishima history after Iron Fist 4, and she feels really sad that Heihachi died. If only he hadn't thrown his son into a ravine. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, she meets a scientist who knows how to build a time machine. What? Who is this guy? How did Xiao Yu find him? Where the fuck do you learn to build something like that? <laughs> Don't worry, Tekken doesn't get so crazy that characters travel back in time. At oh, least kidding. not yet. Huh. King may have been satisfied with defeating Marduk, but the guy was undefeated and he doesn't take his loss very well. The dude literally steals the late Armor King's Jaguar mask and demands a rematch. King hmm. can't let this disrespect stand, so he accepts the challenge. Remember how Dr. Boskanovich was going to save Brian Fury? Well, he does. He gives the guy a perpetual generator, and now he can live a long life again. Brian thanks the doctor by going ape shit and destroying the Manji clan's laboratory. He kills tons of people in the process, Brian, forcing the Yoshimitsu to chase him into the tournament for retribution. After Lei Wulan disbanded the syndicate, Nina found herself out of a job. That's Lost, a pretty outfit. She decided well, so to set that up, Nina. a woman who claims to be her sister. She calls up Anna for a meeting, but as soon as she sees her again, the memories come flooding back. Nina remembers everything, including how the Zaibatsu defeated her. Instantly, Nina starts trying to kill Anna, and the two battle for literal days. That's a lot kiss of stamina. On the bazooka. Eventually, the two get exhausted and agree to settle things at the tournament. That bitch. After Christy's that grandfather bitch. finally gets out from prison, she and Eddie find that he's incredibly sick. It's after talking to a doctor that it's discovered he's terminally ill. Lacking the money needed to save his life, the only hope these two have is to win the tournament. After Kazuya was defeated during Iron Fist 2, Ganryu retired from sumo wrestling. But he still liked to keep track of Zaibatsu events, and that's how he comes across Julia Chang. Reminder, this guy was madly in love with Michelle, yep. and now he's become infatuated with her daughter at the ripe old age of 55. Oh. Since Julia's still seeking G Corporation's reforestation data, Ganryu figures retrieving it himself would be the key to winning her heart. But he's not the oldest competitor returning, because Jinpachi sent his best friend Wang Jinrei a letter inviting him to compete as well. And let's see, at this point in the story, Wang would be... 105 years old? The dude was 82 back in Tekken 1? <laughs> his bones must be as stable as graham crackers at this point. But hey, maybe he'll surprise me. And on that note, let's talk about the tournament. So first up, Jin Kazama defeats Wang Jinrei. <laughs> okay, never mind. This is arguably disappointing because the thing we know most about Wang's backstory is that he was best friends with Jinpachi Mishima. The two have an incredibly close bond. If anyone deserved to take him down, it was Jinrei. But according to Tekken 6, he didn't even get to see the guy. 
canon can often be anticlimactic. <laughs> King and Marduk battle for the second time nice. in a row, and once again, King emerges victorious. Good. Although this outcome changes things forever. Like an echo of the past, Marduk realizes that King is the real deal. And rather than hold a grudge, he chooses to be his ally. Oh. King and Marduk become best friends and also a formidable tag team. All that bad blood, gone forever. Wow. Nina faces off with Anna and gains the victory. That didn't satisfy me at all. I refuse yeah, to kill you. You bitch! <laughs> <laughs> Paul Phoenix enters the tournament with new determination after losing to Kuma. And of course, because someone fucking hates Paul, he finds himself battling <laughs> Kuma yet again. This time, Paul squeaks out a victory, but he is so exhausted from the encounter mm. that he bows out of the tournament. Yoshimitsu clashes with Brian Fury and scores the win. Nice. Afterwards, the cyborg makes his escape, living to fight another day. Asuka meets with Lily for the first time and defeats her. But this would be the worst mistake of her life because she's made a lifetime rival for doing so. Lily forever obsessed with wanting to one-up the young Kazama. Mm. And that's all I got to say about Asuka because the girl never ends up crossing paths with Feng Wei, the guy she wanted to fight. She also never interacts with her cousin Jin, thus wasting a lot of potential the character could have had. Yeah. Since Feng doesn't win the tournament, eventually he just breaks into the Mishima Zaibatsu's vault and steals the <laughs> scroll he was looking for. And instead could of gaining ultimate power, he instead finds words of wisdom. He who destroys all other fighting styles and makes them his own shall become a warrior superior to all men. Oh, golly, thanks for that enlightenment. That's the equivalent of saying, if you want to master something, you should practice at it until you get good. Riveting. <laughs> Fang takes this advice, and his story hasn't budged since. Oh. Jin faces off with his rival Warang, who was recently reunited with his master Beck after he finally woke up from his coma. And taking the new advice that Beck put on to him, Warang gives it his all in the fight, and... He actually wins! Oh, yes, wow! He defeats the badass hero of the last two games, putting him down and knocking him out. Holy wow. shit! Damn. This is what I like to see. The Mishimas aren't so invincible. But while he lies unconscious, something else wakes up. Hmm. Devil Jin. The devil form rises up, catching Warang off guard, and just brutalizes the guy fucks him up good to the point that he has to be sent to the hospital in critical condition. The judges have no reason to deny it, so Jin ultimately wins the fight and thus advances to the finals. Devil Jin is an actual character in the games. He is a separate fighter from Jin who uses the Mishima combat style that was in Tekken 3 and Tekken Tag. Because a lot of people didn't like that Jin fought so differently in Tekken 4. Also, it fills the quota that every fighting game ever has to meet, where the hero of the story has some dark alter ego that is actually playable. Revenant Liu Kang, evil Ryu, it's just a thing, I don't know what to tell ya. <laughs> Yan Ryu doesn't win the tournament, but he does sneak into the Mishima Zaibatsu labs and actually finds Julia's reforestation data. He meets with her to deliver the goods. <laughs> oh yeah, this was the best. <laughs> Sunday. Dude, you just had to put the data disc on your sweaty, smelly dick, didn't you? <laughs> Good God. I can't thank you enough. With this, I'll be able to bring back the forest. <laughs> and she's gone. Oh, Ganryu. He did a great thing for the wrong reason don't think she'll be interested anytime soon. Hmm. However, this is a great day for Julia because getting that research back allows her to actually grow a little seedling, thus making it possible to reforest her land. The thing she's nice. always wanted, now back on track. In another laboratory, <laughs> one abandoned by Dr. Boskanovich, Roger Jr. goes looking for any kind of trace of his dad. Hmm. And well... <laughs> Oh, no. I remember this one too. Yeah. Yeah, he's pissed. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, Roger is a terrible father and husband. He wasn't <laughs> abducted at all. Just enjoying a life of luxury and cheating on his wife. He's been smooching all kinds of lady kangaroos oh! while his family was struggling financially. What a dick! Yeah. What I find amusing about all this is that Roger Jr. ends up running into Alex, Roger's dinosaur rival. After kicking his ass in a very comical way, he brings the guy into his home where Alex hits it off with Roger's wife. The dinosaur is now a beloved father figure within the kangaroo family. <laughs> yes. Although Roger realizes what a terrible mistake he's made. Aww. The fact that this goofy shit is, is ridiculous. warms my An poor awesome. dead heart. Uh, what else happens? Well, Kazia does participate in the tournament, but he doesn't seem to stick around for long. Eventually, he runs into one of his old bodyguards, the returning Bruce Irvin, who's alive and well. And then the two just leave. Kazia may have lost to Jin, but they never say that's what's happened. And even in Jin's story mode, there's never a mandatory battle between the two. The only thing Tekken 6 and 7 likes to say is that Kazuya eventually gets revenge on the corporate bigwigs. There is more to it than that, but first, I gotta cover the finale. Jin Kazama is once again unstoppable, and he comes face to face with the great grandfather he's never met before. And the old man isn't just a master martial artist, he's also grown a goddamn demon mouth on his stomach that shoots unblockable fireballs. Oh. In the middle of a whirlwind tornado, Jin battles his great granddad with everything he's got. And once again, the young Kazama ekes out a victory, destroying Jinpachi for good. Nice. Oh, what a world, what a world. This presents an interesting ending to Tekken 5. Instead of running off as Devil Jin, he stays put and inherits the Mishima Zaibatsu. All those Yakuza, the Tekken Force, the entire conglomerate, it all belongs to the most noble and heroic member of the Mishima family. And it makes you wonder, now that Jin has all of this power, what's he gonna do with this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Probably not something great because he's, you know, related to Heihachi and Kasuya and the Mishima family. Yeah. So probably not going to do something great with it. I mean, I'd like to believe that he's the exception to the rule. I would like to believe mm -hmm. that he will use all of this wealth and power and head of a major corporation to do good in the world. But let's be honest, historically in the real world, that's not how corporate heads actually act. Absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Yes. Yep. I think the most heartwarming story is the kangaroo story. <laughs> oh my god, it's like their stepdad raptor. That's wonderful. The stepdad raptor, yeah, the dad that was like off, you know, I don't know, cheating and just uh, uh, sipping on his wine through his like crazy straw. Uh, yeah, he, he didn't realize what he had, and he threw it away, and now, you know, happy raptor dad. Sup, daddy. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I I understand the desire to, like, escape and have, like, a day to veg out free of all responsibility and everything. Like, fine, okay. That's a day. You don't go away for forever, because then... You're stupid. And also, like, uh, so I know that they showed, like, you know, uh, very chesty uh, Nina and Anna Williams. But at the same time, they do show, uh, you know, I think it was uh, Lee. <laughs> What's his face? Like, in thongs and, you know, just like, and like, and Heihachi was, you know, they showed his ass cracking his taint, like the like he was saying. So, uh, you know, the guys uh, get, get, you know, show a lot of skin as well. So they, they are, they're not selective. They, they, I mean, everybody, everybody shows it. Like two young, attractive women and their busty boobs versus Heiachi's old man butt. But Lee was like a, not exactly equal representation. Was nice here. and toned, and you know had a nice body, and you know. So little, we get one. And the yeah, and we saw his full package. Oh yeah, then we saw he definitely saw we his full package. Saw <laughs> so, so, and it wasn't bad. Everything. It wasn't bad. <laughs> I feel dirty. Having looked at that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And especially saying that's not bad like five times. I mean, guys don't feel dirty after watching Naked Chicks, so I don't know why I feel dirty after looking at like that guy's package through his 
super skin tight pants. But, yeah, you know, you shouldn't. You shouldn't. Sorry. Do you want to go back to it? You want to see it again? I guess you can no. show it. It's fine. I will say, as far as Heihachi goes, fighting in that thong as costume, and, yeah. and forgive me because I know that sounds disrespectful yeah, yeah, for yeah, yeah, Japanese yeah, yeah. culture. I'm just ignorant, and so I don't know the proper terminology. I did not retain it from this video because it was a long video, so I'm very sorry. Um, but what I was going to say is there's a lot of respect there for being willing to show up and fight in what is essentially a thong. Yes, it is a costume for fighting. Yeah. Okay, now you just made it worse by calling it a diaper. Um, it is essentially a costume for fighting. It, it, there, I'm sure there is a, a long and prestigious history there and cultural connection. It reminds me of a sumo wrestler. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's the right costume or if it's different because Heihachi mm. clearly is not a sumo wrestler. Yeah. Um, but to show up in that, to be revealing of that much skin, to be that vulnerable, and be like, I'm here and I'm here to fight in a thong. That's very ballsy. I mean, that is... No pun intended. Oh, God. <laughs> Not intended. Um, but, you know, there is something about that to say, like, I don't care if you bite, scratch, kick, fight, punch. I'm, I'm here in all my skin tight glory of, of being in my almost birthday suit and I'm going to kick your ass. That's, there's something about that. That's pretty impressive. Yep, exactly. That's why, you know, whenever I do shirts versus skins in basketball, I strip down my thong and take my shirt off and I'm just, that is how I play free. Right. <laughs> yes. Anywho. Uh, so we're gonna continue this uh, next week. If you're watching this on Patreon uh, with the final uh, part, we're gonna go on to six and seven for um, Tekken. And then if you're watching this on YouTube, then we're going to it right now after a quick costume change. Woohoo! So the story begins with Jin nice Kazama shades. starting World War III. Oh my god! <laughs> oh yes, I'm serious. The <laughs> first thing that Jin does when he gains control is start claiming oil refineries, space stations, anything that can give the Zaibatsu power. He expands the military and sends the Tekken Force to every corner of the planet just to tear shit up and conquer everything. Damn. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to it. He just attacks civilians because he can. The Mishima Zaibatsu is so strong and has so much power that they somehow manage to conquer the United Nations. I'm no geopolitical expert, but that sounds fucking impossible. Right? The governments of the so. world all just sit there, impotent to combat this threat. But one giant organization Gosh. is leading the charge, forming the biggest resistance to the Zaibatsu's evil. And that organization is G Corporation. See, after killing all of the executives that betrayed him, hmm. Kazuya became the new CEO of the company. And I thought it was just a small biotech firm, but apparently it's expanded quite a bit. Now G Corp has its own private military with thousands of soldiers and tanks. It's the face of multimedia entertainment sponsoring such J-pop idols as Lucky Chloe. Okay. Who, of course, is a martial artist and playable character. The G Corporation is Ooh. using its mad science to create that? super soldiers in the form of roided out Hulk men who scream like fucking monsters. <laughs> and even if they didn't have those, they still have the Jack units because mm. Jane is developing them for the company. And why not? They're the only ones taking the fight to that evil dictator, Jin Kazama. Seriously, as far as the public is concerned, Kazuya is nothing but a saint, a hero who's trying to save the world. Which we know he's not. <laughs> if they mm -hmm. only knew. Hmm. Kazuya's offered a substantial bounty to anyone who can bring him Jin Kazama's head. And as a response to this, the Zaibatsu leader decides to announce the King of Iron Fist Tournament 6. Hmm. <laughs> Which I'm not really sure if now's the time for martial artists <laughs> to be competing in tests of strength. <laughs> But I gotta take a second to acknowledge how the narrative changed from this point onwards. It's the first high-definition Tekken game, the first one to have online play. And it's also the first one to have a proper story mode. Previously, mm. these games have only been experienced one character at a time, fighting eight or nine matches and taking any cutscene you can get. 
but Tekken 6 has a full-blown scenario campaign that focuses on two new characters, Lars Alexanderson and Alyssa Boskanovich. The story follows them the entire way through as you battle in over 38 stages each film with dozens of goons and special bosses. Cool. It's completely canon, it's events referenced in Tekken 7. Hmm. Which is fine, but the King of Iron Fist Tournament 6 goes completely ignored. Mm. The characters don't talk like they're preparing for it, they don't talk like it just happened. Lars and Alyssa never enter any competition, they just head into skirmishes against the Zaibatsu and G Corp. The side characters only seeming to be there so that you have a boss to fight. And when we hmm. get to Tekken 7, instead of having prologues that advance each fighter's story, the player is only briefed on one particular fight that the character finds themselves in. Unless you're a DLC character, in which case you don't even get that. <laughs> Tekken 6 and 7 are far more interested in what's going on with the war and the Mishimas. Hmm. I don't have any tournament details anymore because there aren't any. So yeah. Lars Anderson used yeah. to be the head of the Tekken Force. Apparently the dude's always been there behind the scenes, we just never got acquainted with him. But when Jin Kazama starts using the Zaibatsu to destroy the world, Lars takes a step back and asks himself, Wait a minute, are we the baddies? <laughs> <laughs> and so he breaks off, managing to take over 50% of the Tekken Force with him. Wow. God damn. These turncoat Tekkens would wear new flags and call themselves Yggdrasil. It's at this point that Eddie Gordo approaches Jin for help regarding his Capoeira Master. See, he didn't win the last tournament, which means he still doesn't have the money to pay for his medical bills. Jin agrees to help, but only if Eddie fills the vacant spot left behind by Lars. And so Eddie Gordo becomes the leader of the Tekken Force, participating in a war he wanted nothing to do with. He shares an advisory role with Nina Williams, who acts as Jin Kazama's second-in-command. In fact, Nina joining the Zaibatsu encourages her sister Anna to join G Corporation of course. along with Bruce Irvin. Quite the stables we got here. <laughs> anyway, the plot really kicks off when Yggdrasil goes on a mission to take over one of the Zaibatsu's laboratories. Lars leads his squad inside, kicking all kinds of ass, <laughs> but eventually they come across a control room with some kind of cryo chamber. Yeah, do you remember that plot point from Tekken 3? <laughs> of course you don't. During this invasion, <laughs> Yggdrasil gets surprised when G Corporation also shows up, flooding the place with jack robots. There's a scuffle and an explosion which knocks Lars out and conveniently gives him amnesia. It's at this point that he accidentally opens the cryo chamber, unleashing Alyssa Boskanovich, hmm. who is equipped with jet boosters, what? chainsaw arms, oh. and also has the ability to take off her own head and use it as an explosive. Oh my god! She's she has awesome! An infinite supply of heads, thanks to nano machines. <laughs> this character is so anime and over the top that even for some Tekken fans, it was too much. <laughs> Oh, I can handle the devil gene. I can handle bears who know kung fu. But kawaii anime robot girls who tear shit up with chainsaws? <laughs> You've gone too far, Tekken. <laughs> Good point. I'm more shocked about what kind of guy Dr. Boskanovich is. The old man lost his daughter to disease and then completely recreated her as a fighting robot. <laughs> That's really weird, man. Also strange, Dr. Boskanovich never appears in either Tekken 6 or Tekken 7. His hmm. robo daughter plays such a significant role in the story, and he just goes bye bye. Where is he? I don't think he's dead. He shows up for the tag games trying to analyze male pattern baldness on the Mishimas. <laughs> no, really. Which apparently is negated by the devil gene. No, really. But he himself <laughs> is just gone now. The way that stories are told in Tekken is just so bizarre sometimes. <laughs> Anyway, Lars and Alyssa escape the base, and since they both don't know what's going on, they decide to go on a journey for answers. One which has them fighting street thugs, the Tekken Force, robots, bear cubs, kangaroos, a uh, yeah. marching parade, what? sumo wrestlers, and even goddamn demons. There's so little narrative structure to the campaign that I have no idea why they're in the places that they <laughs> are. What good is Finding Armor King gonna do? Oh yeah, Armor King's alive. Kind of. See, after King and Marduk made up and became friends, someone ambushed the Valley Tudo fighter in the locker room. And he looks exactly like Armor King. But later, King is reminiscing about his old master when he makes a shocking discovery. <laughs> 
there are two. I'm sorry, but that jaguar mask makes everything funny. <laughs> Turns out this new Armor King is the brother of the old one. Why the hell did he hide that? Armor King didn't think it was worth mentioning that he was in a tag team with his brother? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Armor King 2 wants revenge on Marduk, and King is caught in the middle. Anyway, eventually Lars ends up running into Togu, one of his comrades in Yggdrasil. Hearing that the guy has amnesia, he tells him that beforehand he was looking forward to meeting Heihachi Mishima, and perhaps seeking him out will jog his memory. Worth mentioning that Lars is a pretty chill guy. He values his squad, he knows how to joke around, the guy isn't an edgelord nor a colossal douchebag. <laughs> nice. Just keep that in mind as we get to the twist. Lars and Alyssa do indeed seek out Heihachi, who this whole entire time has been chilling in his estate. After a failed assassination attempt by the Tekken Force, he's just been plotting and scheming over how to get the Zaibatsu back. Hmm. Upon seeing Heihachi, something triggers in Lars's head. His memory comes back completely, reminding him of his true heritage. <laughs> Yes, Lars is actually a Mishima, a bastard child from one of Heihachi's youthful indiscretions. Mm -hmm. Because he can't have the hero of the story be anything but. With his memory returned, Lars aims to kill the man who abandoned his mother. Did you just headbutt it? He got it in his teeth. Oh. <laughs> Once again, unkillable. <laughs> Lars basically goes, all right, fuck it. I got more important things to do. His new goal for the game is to take down Jin Kazama and end the war. This involves breaking into the Zaibatsu headquarters, taking down the Tekken Force, Eddie Gordo, Nina Williams, even a giant demon robot named Nancy. Yes, Nancy? Nancy. Why Nancy? And of all the times I've gone through Tekken 6's arcade mode, I have never beaten this damn thing. Oh, oh damn, you wow. You the next match as soon as you lose, so it takes forever just to retry. Screw you, Nancy. <laughs> but eventually Lars ends up riding the elevator into Jin's throne room, where the guy has commissioned a comically evil statue of his devil gauntlet clutching the world. Just a tad on the nose. <laughs> Before Lars can take this guy out, though, Jin activates his secret weapon. Arisa, mode oh no! Arisa, Finding her in a Mishima laboratory was no coincidence. Hmm. Dr. Boskanovich created her to serve as Jin's bodyguard. And because he's the head honcho, she has to obey anything he commands. No, no Alyssa, please! This isn't you! <laughs> Think of all the good times we had! <laughs> Footage not found. <laughs> Jin makes his escape and heads to Egypt, to a special ruin that was hidden away by magic until the Zaibatsu started destroying the world. That was good. This place houses a very nasty creature known as Azazel, the Rectifier. And apparently it's waking up, Whoa. creating volcanoes and shit in the Middle East. <laughs> Lars is joined by Raven and proceeds deep inside, where he encounters the G Corporation as well. He and Kazuya have a scuffle. <laughs> Oh yeah, apparently all the electricity that flies off of Heihachi and Kazuya, that's a Mishima bloodline thing. I guess they descended Kick from the, the thunder pig. god Raiden. Lars reaches the center of the ruins and comes face to face with Azazel, a giant Anubis monster and by far the cheapest fucking boss in any Tekken game ever. <laughs> I swear, even Damn. on easy mode, this asshole is ridiculously cheap. I hate him with the fury of a thousand suns. <laughs> Luckily in scenario nice. campaign, you have buffed stats, and you can sneak behind him while he's distracted by Raven. Double teaming this prick is so damn satisfying. <laughs> Lars defeats the creature, but nice he still has one target left. Quite a new Jean outfit Kazama. too. But not before being forced to battle his former friend. No. <laughs> Oh. Screw you! Oh, you're gonna die. Yeah. yeah. <gasps> Wait, 
Oh, you motherfucker. Yeah. The final battle. Lars, Jin, him, Lars. and a squadron of Tekken Force goons who love to snipe me from far away. <laughs> hey. But eventually Lars pulls off the victory. And it's now, at the end, where we finally get an explanation as to why Jin did all this. So remember the nightmares he was having in Tekken 5? He was being communicated to by Azazel the Rectifier, and the Beast mm. tells Jin that the Devil Gene is his creation, that Azazel is the source. And when human misery gets so strong all over the world, it's going to return and destroy everyone. Only someone with the Devil Gene can stop him. But what if Azazel returns long after Jin and Kazuya are dead? Who will save the world then? So using the power of the Zaibatsu, Jin single-handedly attacks everything and everyone just so Azazel would wake up earlier. And Dude, sure enough, Lars did not used. actually defeat the beast. Yeah. It comes out of the temple to bring about Armageddon. But Jin rushes towards it, punches a hole through its chest, or not. and falls with it into a ravine. The creature killed for good. Oh, wow. It's not for me to judge if he was right or wrong. Maybe you're such a saint. You think you can. Oh, fuck mm -hmm. off, lady. <laughs> yes, Jin technically saved the world, but he killed so many innocent people yeah. to get us there. The world will never be the same. No. I remember a lot of people were put off by the decision to turn Jin heel, and it's yeah. completely changed the character. Now yeah. he's an edgy sad boy who just wants to die. <laughs> to get his comeuppance for all the evil that he's done. Tekken and its morality, they just didn't want everything to be so cut and dry. Hmm. Lars leaves Alyssa with Lee Chowlon to be restored to normal, and Raven ends up finding Jin after everything's all said and done. And with that, we only have one more game to talk about. All right. <laughs> So as of August 2022, this is the newest game in the series. It has a two hour long story mode that aims to explain a pressing question that many fans have had for years. Who was Heihachi's wife? Who was Kazuya's mother? Believe it or not, the identity of this character was hinted at ages ago in Tekken 2. Because in the dojo stage, you can find an engraved marking pairing up the names of Heihachi and Kazumi. This is something that's actually existed since 1996. But I don't Tekken know. is a very right? secretive and mysterious franchise, so it was left alone until now. Not much has changed since the end of Tekken 6. Azazel may be dead, but the war between the Mishima Zaibatsu and G Corporation is still raging strong. With Jin missing in the Middle East, the Zaibatsu is running aimless. This forces Heihachi to return from the shadows, storming in hmm. to take his company back. And Nina sends the entire Tekken force after the guy. Frog good, dude. armed with machine guns and grenades and rocket launchers. And Heihachi still swats all of them Kicks away. It. Like Kicked the it. Flies yeah. they are. Are you starting to understand why this man is one of my favorite video game characters ever? <laughs> Heihachi beats Nina's ass, declaring the company his once again. And Nina, with nothing better to do, decides to serve under him. Mm -hmm. With the Zaibatsu back in his control, Heihachi announces the King of Iron Fist Tournament 7. The purpose of this competition is to draw out Kazuya and expose him for who he really is. You see, the King of Iron Fist Tournament 2 wasn't televised, so no one but Heihachi really saw his devil form. And the only time he ever transformed again is when he fled Hanmaru back in Tekken 5. No one knows what this guy is capable of, only that he's the hero who fought Jin Kazama. This tournament will be the perfect venue to show everyone that he is, in fact, the devil. And that's why the Zaibatsu can't possibly stop fighting this war, because they're the good guys, actually. <laughs> It's quite the plan, quite the plan indeed. But while meditating inside of his dojo, Heihachi is visited by a special guest. Three ghosts. Whoa, 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 yeah. what the hell? Akuma? That's yeah. Akuma. Akuma, if you're unfamiliar, is from Capcom's Street Fighter franchise. Ever since Super Street Fighter 2, this guy has been a special boss fight, one of the deadliest villains in the lore. He's a man who sacrificed his humanity to gain the ultimate power, the Satsui no Hado. His motivation is to find a truly worthy opponent, constantly egging Ryu, the series hero, into joining the dark side. Hmm. That's all well and good, but what the hell's he doing here? 
I'm no stranger to the concept of guest characters, but they're not typically driving the plot. Like, when you're playing Mortal Kombat 11, it's not like Robocop shows up out of nowhere to save the day. Mm. But Akuma True. is integral, because he is here to deliver vengeance on behalf of Kazumi That's what's kind of cool about that. Is that Akuma is part of the story. Yeah. Yeah. What? For context, Kazumi died on the exact same day that Kazuya was thrown off the cliff. That was like 40 years ago. <laughs> Akuma was given a task to prevent two men from destroying the world, and he waited until He's after a fucking world war to start killing them. Nothing about Tekken makes any goddamn sense. So the two battle each other, and because Capcom has really tight protection on their character, Akuma, of course, defeats Heihachi. Hmm. Oh. But to be fair, Tekken's very protective too, because right after delivering the raging demon, Akuma buries Heihachi's body, plants him in the ground, leaving to go after Kazuya next. But Heihachi isn't dead. Of course not. From your grave. This is getting comical now. The raging demon is supposed to be pretty strong. It is canon in the Street Fighter games that M. Bison was killed by this very move his soul needing to transfer to another body that he had prepared. Oh yeah, Street Fighter's pretty weird too, but still, <laughs> Heihachi survived all of that. Unkill a bull. <laughs> but for some reason, Heihachi wants the world to think he's dead, so the Zaibatsu does just that. They cancel the King of Iron Fist Tournament 7. <laughs> Why? Instead, the new plan is to wait for Kazuya and Akuma to battle, and when they do, Kaz will have no choice but to turn devil form in order to survive. And the Zaibatsu will be there with drones to take pictures, exposing him to the world. And that's basically what happens. But also, Heihachi decides to kill them both by utilizing Dr. Abel's space can. <laughs> you remember, the thing that took out Jack 2 is still up there, and it's in the possession of Heihachi. Damn. He fires the thing off, destroying the G Corporation's Millennium Tower. Why did no one think to do that before? <laughs> and of course, Kazuya is still alive. The world turns on him. Heihachi sends the devil pictures to the media, and everyone is so shocked and horrified to learn that the world's savior is actually Satan. So Kazuya gets revenge by firing his big fuck off devil laser into outer space, <laughs> destroying Dr. Abel's space cannon. Fuck off. And this causes satellite debris to crash into a major city, which turns the public back against the Zaibatsu. I'm not kidding. Apparently the public is under the impression that the Zaibatsu did it on purpose. Why would they do that? The atrociousness of the fighting was inconceivable to the average person. And they soon forgot about Kazuya transforming into a devil. Because apparently that's something you forget. <laughs> anyway, one thing Tekken 7 does different from the other games is tell its the story narrator. through the yeah. eyes of a journalist. Yeah. One who is covering the Mishima family, looking for information on how this whole war started. He approaches Heihachi asking for an interview, and surprisingly, he accepts. See, this is Heihachi's last stand. With the reputation of the Mishima Zaibatsu all but ruined, he challenges his son to one last fight. Winner take all, there can be only one. So in case he doesn't come back, Heihachi decides to get his story out there, revealing the truth of his wife's death. He was married to Kazumi Hachicho, a fellow martial artist that Heihachi loved very much. That is until she started to show symptoms of a split personality. And this alter ego reveals that she married into the Mishima family purely to kill Heihachi before he eventually becomes a threat to the world. Yeah. The Hachicho family has been forever cursed with the devil Such gene, exacting vengeance on whomever they please. They have a fierce fight, but again, Heihachi is just too damn powerful. Hmm.
Just brutal. Snaps mm. his wife's neck, despite how devastated it leaves him. And so we have a bit of a retcon here. Heihachi did not throw his son off the cliff to see if he was worthy of the Mishima name. He did it because he wanted to see if his son had the devil gene. Which is a little confusing. If he does survive, then why would you raise him knowing full well there's a split personality just waiting to kill you? <laughs> but if he dies, well, good one, dude. You just murdered your innocent son for <laughs> no reason. Oh, the twisted morality of Tekken, trying to make us sympathize with the man who laughs maniacally and bombs buildings with laser cannons. Sure. Katsumi knew he was a monster, so I'm not sure she's actually a villain. But hey. Kazi and Heihachi we ran our side as well. Yeah. For their final showdown. And my recap can't possibly do it justice. It's got multiple phases, flashbacks to the past 20 years of Tekken games, Kaz fights in his devil form, Heihachi turns Super Saiyan. These guys just beat the living shit out of each other, Kaz even nuking his old man with lasers, <laughs> and he somehow survives. Boku. <laughs> Heihachi strikes Kazuya so hard that the guy reverts back to his human form. Keep in mind that Kaz still hasn't beaten his father since Tekken 1. He lost in Tekken 2, he lost in Tekken 4, his dad will not go down! He still feels like the helpless five-year-old boy. This is his last chance. It's now or never. <laughs> Whoa. Exploding his heart. And he does it. Kazuya defeats Heihachi Mishima. You sound so sad. And as these Tekken games tend to go, it ends on a cliff peering over the volcanic landscape. And that's what we call karma. <laughs> you learned that from your father. Yep. After all of that, Heihachi Mishima is finally dead. Just kidding. God damn. So where does this leave the story of Tekken? Well, one thing I glossed over is that Lars ends up finding Jin in the Middle East and brings him to Li Chaolan for protection. He spends the entire game unconscious until the very end. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the insane lore of Tekken. Yes, it is. So I'm not in the habit of doing series recap videos. My next project sure as hell won't be two hours long, nor will I avoid talking about the gameplay. But I can't talk strategy with Tekken because I have no grounds to do so. I'm no expert. Hell, my footage is probably the most basic combat you've ever seen. But that's kind of what I've been trying to say. I'm not good at playing it, but I've still gotten 20 years of entertainment value. The nice. incredible music, the badass character designs, the ridiculousness that occurs is so damn fun. It doesn't matter that I'm playing by myself most of the time, because Tekken is an experience. Tekken is a way of Ooh. life. And there's so much that I cut out of this video for brevity. I didn't mention the new character Eliza, a vampire lady who woke up from a deep sleep quicker than she was supposed to, so now she's a narcoleptic. Little <laughs> Rochefort seems to think that Eliza is her sister. Why do you have a vampire sister? <laughs> you know why Nina and Anna are dressed as a bride and widow in the character select screen? Because Nina went on an assassination mission to kill a G Corporation guy on his wedding day. Thing is, this guy was getting married to Anna, who actually found love after Tekken 6. Oh. Nina killed her sister's fiance! Damn. I am forever on Team Anna because Nina is just an awful person, my <laughs> god. There's a lot of non-canon material for you guys to discover, and it has pretty good character stuff too. 
In Warang's Tekken 6 ending, he grabs an orb from Azazel's body, which has the power to grant people the Devil Gene. It actually does so in Ganryu's ending, which would be scary Ooh. if not for the fact that he's too fat to fly. <laughs> because of course he is. But in Warang's <laughs> ending, he actually rejects the orb and smashes it to pieces. See, Warang is a proud man. He knows that he beat Jin fair and square in Tekken 5, so the guy refuses to cheat, to stoop to Jin's level. He doesn't need that power, he's gonna beat Devil Jin the old-fashioned way. Which may very well be canon, we'll just have to wait and see. I love <laughs> Kazuya's ending in Tekken 5 because it shows just how far the man has fallen. He loved Jinpachi when he was a kid, he has nothing but warm feelings for the guy. And yet, the prospect of power is just far more intoxicating, so he gladly mm. kills his grandpa, smiling like the devil he is. Oh my oh. god, there's a lot of great shit here! So I apologize if I missed out on talking about your favorite character. I'm also sorry if I got any details wrong. It's kinda hard to keep track of all this. Please be kind, please be kind. No. If there's any wacky shit in the story that you think I glossed <laughs> over, feel free to mention it in the comments section. Tekken 8 seems to be on the horizon, and I look forward to seeing just how crazy that it's going to be. So until then, let's get ready for the next battle. So I thought Clement, uh, J64 did a great job in this video, uh, especially like, you know, I mean, admitting that he's not, it's, he doesn't play Tekken because he's like awesome at it or whatever. It's like he doesn't play it to, to get, be great at it. He just plays it because it's a lot of fun and really liked the craziness, the insanity of the game itself. And so to do all the research on this and and, and uh, present this video, um, even like, and, and admitting that there's so much more that he was not able to cover, uh, I just thought it was really impressive. People are messy. And Tekken takes that to a whole new level. Yeah. Um, maybe I'm skipping back one, but I was pretty sure in the last one I was cheering for Jin. And now he's evil and starting World War III. I mean, just the the like 180 that these characters can make. And, and maybe it's not a 180 for them as a character, but for the, the impact on the audience, it, it's a 180 because you hate them and you want them to die, but then you're cheering for them and you're like, wait, what the hell just happened? Mm -hmm. um, and that's very much how I feel about particularly Jin and uh, Kazuya. Because I feel like Heihachi, he's kind of always yeah, a villain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lars kind of always feels like the hero. But Kazuya and Jin are the two who, like, you think you like one and you hate the other. And then it flips it. And you're like, wait a minute. Now I'm cheering for the other one. And what just happened? Mm -hmm. And then it kind of flips it again. Um so I, I applaud them in their storytelling for taking us on that journey and for making us, as the audience, feel like, okay, I get this character, and then completely reversing what we think we know. Um, that's indicative of good storytelling, that's indicative of complex characters, which keeps everything interesting. And I do it with Nina as well, because like I really think I'm cheering for Nina, but then Nina goes and kills the groom of her yeah! sister, where her sister finally finds happiness, and you're just like, Wow, Nina, that was that was a dick move. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I do appreciate their storytelling in that you don't always have a firm grasp on the characters. In fact, you you rarely ever do. And uh, you know, we talked about how this is reminds us a lot of um, Succession, just because like all yes. like like the characters were just terrible people um, in it, <laughs> yeah. and you're just kind of watching like the the train wreck that is their life. Um, but also like uh, when you're talking about you know, the one that characters would do and like liking a character, then hating a character and then um, rooting for the character again, maybe at a, a different point. Um, it reminded me a lot of Lost uh, mm. when we checked that out. Like there were different times, like that's what I liked about, you know, that that show is that there were different points where I was like cheering for a certain character and then all of a sudden something would change and like all of a, and then I'm not, I'm like, ooh, now I, now I don't know so much ab about you and like, you know, you've lost your way and I'm, and I'm kind of like cheering against you. So I like that, that Tekken does that. They tried so hard, it seems like with Heihachi to kind of like, redeem him, especially in, in Tekken 7, to be like, oh no, he didn't throw him off to, to see if he's worthy of the Mishima family. He threw him off because he thought he was a devil. And, I you don't know. care. Yeah, and so, uh, it, and um, I like that, uh, I, I agree with Clement, um, because when we watched the Tekken 7 cutscenes, we did a reaction to that, which you can check out in the description of this video. We have a playlist there for all of our Tekken reactions. Um, but we were very much on, uh, Katsuya's side, because uh, Jim wasn't in Tekken 7, really. And um, also, like, we kind of agreed with Heihachi's wife. Like, I mean, I, you know, 
okay, yeah, go ahead and kill um, Heihachi. Maybe Katsuya wouldn't be such a, you know, I mean, yes, he had the devil gene in him, but I don't necessarily know if that mean, means you're going to be a terrible person. It seems like he was terrible because of his upbringing with uh, Heihachi and, and then that got passed on and then for Virgin and then like they all felt like they were trying to justify their terrible actions. Like Jim was, okay, uh, Azazel, he was, he had to bring him out but by bringing on World War III, it's like, okay, well, there was no telling when Azazel was gonna come out or if he was ever gonna come out. Yep. So you just killed a bunch of the, uh, people to, to kill him. And yeah, maybe if he had come out, come out at one point, you know, and you weren't alive around then, then you would have, you know, then he would have killed everyone and, then, and you know, that would have been terrible. But uh, who knows, like I said, who knows when that would have happened, if it would have ever happened. And just all the innocent people that he, he, he killed yeah. to, to get to that, the, to me, the, Ends do not justify the means, but you know that's, that, that is debatable, and that's why he said like the morality of, of Tekken is is very interesting. Yeah, which I I love the twisted morality of it because it it gives you so much to kind of dive into. I mean, I think it's in most cases very apparent that our parents will be the biggest defining influence for us as people and in mm -hmm. our lives. Um, they raise Until us get for wife. our. our until you get away. Yeah, there you go. Uh, they raise us for our formative years. They they have the the means to make us feel huge or small with their praise or disappointment. I mean, there is so much that parents can do impacting their children. Um, that just seeing how Katsuya lives his life, I mean, there, there's almost like a it's not a justification, but there's almost like a, a small allowance for that. They're like, yeah, but did you see his father? I mean, like everything, yeah. everything Katsuya does, you kind of revert back to like, yeah, but his father tried to kill him. When he yeah, I know, yes. Um, and that's that's gonna mess you up without a doubt. Um, and for his his mom and Heihachi's wife, I, I almost kind of liken it to um, some of the fan theories that were going out about uh, the Targaryens in Game of Thrones. Mm. So if you haven't watched Game of Thrones, spoiler, maybe like bleep this for the next, I don't know, 15 seconds. <laughs> um, but there was a great and insane fan theory that the whole reason that Aerys Targaryen wanted to burn everyone in King's Landing is because he had the foresight to know what was coming with the White Walkers. And so in his twisted mental situation, he was saying, burn everyone so that they don't turn into White Walkers and kill us all. I didn't know um, that theory. You never told me that. Yeah, that was a fan theory. That That's was pretty cool. Out. It never panned out in the TV show. I don't know if it will in George R. R. Martin's books because, you know, he's yet to finish them. Yeah. But I remember seeing that and going like, whoa, that just, that brings a sympathetic tone to a character who previously we've just considered to be a horrific monster because mm -hmm. he wants to burn everyone alive. And I kind of feel like they try to do a, a, a little bit of that with Heihachi, but they do it really well with Heihachi's wife because mm -hmm. you think a mother who wants to murder her son and her husband is very irreversibly screwed up, terrible person, sociopath, psychopath. I don't know what the right term is, but like you cringe at that idea. Yeah. And yet they then say, oh, but she knew what was coming with Heihachi and with Kasuya. And you think of all the people that those two men combined have killed, mm -hmm. all those innocent lives lost. And you go, I mean, like, okay, I kind of get it. Well, I mean, and then Kasuya's son, Jin, how many people he killed? And and that's the thing with Jin. Like we left off and we were cheering for Jin because he seems to be the most sane and the most normal and the most yeah. kind of all of them. And then we open and he's starting World War III and he's like, pardon the expression, but like, fuck it, burn it to the ground. And you go, wait, Jin, no, you were like, you were our hope. You were our Anakin Skywalker mm -hmm. and now you're our all Darth Vader and what the hell? Like, you're not supposed to do that. You were the chosen one, Jin. Which is why Lars can't be like, like Lars is like almost too good uh, for Tekken to be like be the the hero, but um, the uh, oh uh, I'm blanking on his name right now, but the guy that like had the orb like in one of the maybe non-canon endings, but then like rejected it because he wanted to beat Jin with without it, like was Jin's yes. rival. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to say it begins with, begins with an H. I uh, forgot his name right right now. You say H and all I think is Heihachi. Yeah, so yeah, just, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm stuck yeah. on that right um, now. But I, I like. I hope he comes back in Tekken Eight, and I hope that he plays a, a bigger part in it. 
because I feel like he could have a really interesting uh, storyline and, and like almost ultimately be like the the hero that we root for. Because I kind of want like like at the end, okay, yeah, Jin and Katsuya, like like I want Jin to take down Katsuya, but I want like them to both like kill each other. Like I mean, you guys can both die for all I care. <laughs> it is funny that a franchise that arguably has given us no main characters to love or cheer for um, is so successful because like you don't love any of the main characters who are basically the the male family line mm -hmm. for the story. And yet somehow you find a way to cheer for them because they are the lesser of two evils. Yeah. And and that is, I think, a really tough story to tell. So bravo to the people who thought of this, who, who script it out in the games, because generally speaking, two terrible characters are just a turnoff. And you're like, why do I care? Why am I invested in this? Why am I cheering or participating in mm -hmm. it in any way like they're just they're terrible people why why am i here um but they actually make you care in in a in a really strong and i don't know like primal way even though it's twisted and, and messed up you you still do um and so whatever chord they've hit however they've tapped into that is really smart on their part and i think it's it's kind of like almost like winning the lottery like you don't often watch shows because like, I'm going to watch the show because, you know, lesser of two evils. Yeah. No. If you've got like two hours in an evening for yourself, finally, you don't waste it on that. You go for like, I want to watch something I care about and want to watch and feel good about watching. So I, I kind of think they struck the lottery with somehow finding the right in in the right niche to get you hooked. Yeah. It's I mean, like, well, I mean, sometimes... It's like watching whatever a car wreck or a train wreck, and you just can't look a, can't look away uh, because of it because you're so like just fascinating on what's what's gonna ha happen next. Um, but like also like that train wreck is like part of like there's a clown car in there because like crazy shit pops out like you know like a, a panda and uh, a bear and, <laughs> and a kid, kangaroo yeah. and uh, yeah and so there's and the, the bear wants to bang the panda. Um, so yeah, I mean it's just uh, like. I think that that's one of the ways that they're able to get away with it is that, yes, there are terrible protagonists in this one and they're not necessarily likable, but there's so much crazy shit that's going on there that they're not taking it too seriously and getting like too heavy. There's like, yeah, okay, like, you know, there's not too many good people in the world in general, so we're not gonna, you know, sugarcoat this and <laughs> give you a false sense of hope of the, of the world. Uh, and, you know, but we're gonna put some, uh, some funny stuff that happens uh, along the way and some some craziness. And I think Tekken is just really a great uh, reflection of life. I also love the part where they talked about just the negative energy and like too much negative energy in the world kind of like impacted the the devil gene or whatever yeah, it was yeah, when yeah, it went yeah, into yeah. that a little bit. And I thought, God, I was like, I can't believe I'm sitting here thinking this about Tekken because Tekken is kind of absurd and ridiculous and crazy and and all of those things which i'm not saying in a judgmental like negative fashion but just yeah. kind of like you don't expect to then find parallels in the real world and part of me is sitting here thinking go well shit like it feels like we're in a time when there's a lot of negative energy in the world and people are at each other's throats and there's divisiveness and there's just like all of this kind of toxic shit coming to the surface and then i was like God, like, am I kind of like hoping for a Jin or a Katsuya to like, come and clean shit up? Which I shouldn't be, but there was just that moment where they were explaining that. I thought, we're kind of living in those times now. Yeah. Um, which also historically, there have been many times when bad stuff's happened in the world. And historically, every generation has kind of thought, oh, this is the end. Like, I'm the last generation or like, this is the worst time in history that I'm living through. Some have probably been right about that. There's, I'm not making a, a statement on which time period in history is worse than others, but it just made me think of right now and the fact that there seems to be so much negative energy and hatred and toxicity kind of bubbling up to the surface and just the commentary that Tekken seemed to be paralleling here. And I, I, I don't know, I was like, I'm very surprised that I'm able to parallel Tekken with real world life times that we're living in. It's crazy. It is crazy. I mean, because there are a lot of deadbeat kangaroo dads out there right now living in the world. There are. An important spotlight on that issue. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anyways, uh, 
So, uh, if you want all of our Tekken uh, 7 reactions, Tekken 7 reactions, or you know, you can check our Tekken 7 reactions, or just all of our Tekken reactions, check out the description of this video. We got a playlist there for you, as well as a link to our Patreon. We can get uh, early ad-free access to our reactions, and for longer reactions like this, we upload them weekly, so then you can get that. Uh, or you can just watch them all here at once on YouTube, and we do yeah. one big, long video. So, you know, whatever, wh whatever your jam is, that's fine with us. All right, you know, yeah. no, no kink shaming here. Thanks so much for checking out our reaction for the insane lore of Tekken, which you keep in mind. That our reaction is definitely not definitive.